Thank you, Teresa, uh, for the for the opening prayer. Very much appreciated. So uh, we 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 have a, a good crowd here tonight. Um, it's unfortunate that we see some people sitting so far from us. When there's some some good seats up front, uh, you're welcome to trade places if you want uh, throughout the night. Uh, one of the key things that I, I would just like to express before we get started is the importance tonight. Uh, and, and I guess I'll uh, speak to the elephant in the room a, a little bit in that, yes, uh, it is political season that, that is upon us. Uh, there is growing tension in the community and that, that much we all know. Uh, we can't avoid it. We can't uh, ignore it. It's there. Uh, we, we see the tension in the office. We see the tension in the community. And I hear about the tension on social media. Uh, tonight, I would ask that, uh, you know, just as we've done for the last year and a half and all of these community meetings, we continue on with respect. We continue to have good open discussion as community members. And uh, you know, as, as chief and council or, or whoever is being addressed, if you ask questions respectfully, that's great. I, we appreciate that. And uh, we'll always do our best to respond in a respectful manner as well. So I, I just hope that uh, you know, we can maintain that tonight, that respectful dialogue that, that has carried us through so far and that we continue, right on, thank you, Kevin. Uh, so we continue on with the, the respectful dialogue that we've had to date, and uh, we can get through the night with uh, you know, everybody having a chance to express themselves and, and ask whatever questions they may have. Some housekeeping items. We have uh, coffee, although it says hot chocolate on there, it is coffee. Uh, we have tea, we have muffins, cookies. Uh, there's also a number of handouts that are there. We have the agenda for this evening. We have some documentation regarding uh, the housing policy that's in the works. We also have the land code that is there, or draft land code, sorry, that is for discussion purposes. Uh, right, Fred? It has its watermark for discussion purposes. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit to these items as we go through the agenda. But uh, so if you haven't had a chance to pick up the documentation, if you'd like to, that's fine. Uh, it's over here to my to my left. Good. So I'd, I'd like to start off the first item on our agenda here is budgeting and investments. So this year, um, we, uh, we asked all directors and managers to provide budgets, present budgets, uh, to, uh, and prepare budgets for the upcoming fiscal year. So that would be 2018, 2019. The deadline to get all of these budgets in was uh, February 21st. Uh, the budgets were then, uh, uh, sorry, January 31st. Uh, the budgets were presented to council on February 21st. And on March 2nd, um, all department budgets were uh, approved at a duly convened council meeting. So this is uh, something that was in our financial administration bylaw uh, that we've had for a few years. Uh, however, it was something that we had never um, fully implemented in, in practice. So this year, for the first year, uh, first time in our, in, in, that I'm aware of uh, in Listigush history, we provided budgets, presented them to council, and then those budgets were then approved by council. So I've asked uh, if that was done in the past, uh, not in probably the last 20, so 20 years or so. With that, it gives us an opportunity to answer some of the questions that people always ask is, where do our monies go, right? And now, so we can tell you where some of those investments are planned for the upcoming year, and I'll be able to, uh, I'll highlight a few for you now. So there's uh, over 500,000 that's going to be invested in community reinvestments. So that would be programs like beautification. Uh, $1.1 million invested in education. We're going to be beefing up uh, our dog control program this year. That was a specific request of council. Uh, there's 157,000 that is set aside for the youth center. $2.1 million to be invested into the capital infrastructure program, which includes housing. And specifically, one specific portion in that 
is $350,000 set aside for elders' emergency repairs. So these are all the, some of the investments that uh, our dollars are going towards this year. That, that's specific to own source revenues. So some, some of the money that we make through our economic development, through our fisheries dollars, through chipper operations, they are being reinvested into the community in a number of areas, a number of programs. So some of those, are, those are some of the key. In addition to that, what's, what's great to know is that after all these investments, right now we're still looking at almost a $2.2 million surplus for the year. So we are in a good financial position. We can uh, withstand some fluctuations uh, and still be in a good, good situation. Uh, we can handle emergencies if they come up. We're, we're prepared for that. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty cool to go through that exercise. I know it was a lot of fun and a lot of hard work uh, for the managers, meeting with finance staff, uh, meeting with our, our auditors, and, and making sure that things were set up and, and done in a certain way. Um, and I think we're only going to get better at it as we go forward. With that, uh, another aspect I guess that I'll speak to on, on the budgeting side is we have looked at the financial administration law uh, through the First Nations Financial Management Act. That again is a step forward in improving our financial practices as a community, uh, improving transparency, improving decision making, and improving planning. Uh, we are well on our way in that process. We have been added to the schedule I think as recently as yesterday uh, by uh, Indian Affairs, which means that we are stepping into our own territory, we're moving into our own jurisdiction with, when, it re when it comes to financial administration. So we develop our own policies, we, develop our, we have our own financial law. Um, it's also, if you've been listening to um, the ministers, uh, ministers Philpott and Bennett speak about upcoming uh, agreements, um, financial agreements, financial transfers, payments, the dollars that we receive as a community, they're looking at more and more flexibility uh, for First Nation communities. By moving towards a financial administration law for ourselves, we're putting ourselves in a situation where we would be able to access 10-year grants, 10-year grant funding as opposed to the proposal-driven grant, uh, proposal-driven funding that we receive now. So it's uh, of great benefit to us as a community if we can keep moving in that direction. Another exercise that we did at, at Council was on January 29th. We did a prioritization exercise. Um, the, the top three priorities that came out of, of, from Council for this, this coming year um, would be our elders, our Mi'kmaq language, and to develop our governance. So what that means is that throughout the year you'll see initiatives that are initiatives of programs, dollars that are committed towards supporting our elders, such as the Elder Repair Program, but that's not where we, we would stop. We would try to see what else can we do to support our elders, recognize our elders, and, and, and have our elders more involved uh, in, in, in our community. Mi'kmaq language. Uh, we know that we have an immersion program at, at various levels that, that, that's been running for a couple of years now. We have adult immersion, we have uh, immersion for kids, we have language classes, we've offered those for years. We have some of our, our teachers and former teachers that are here um, teaching in the language, but um, the lang Mi'kmaq language is not just an education issue. It's, it, it's an issue that I think belongs to, to mental health, um, it belongs to self-esteem. It can fit in other areas. How can we as an entire community, or how, is, how can we as Listigoch across all directorate, directorates support the language? So uh, ideas around that could be uh, changing the names of our directorates to Mi'kmaq names. That promotes the language, the use of the language, the understanding uh, policies or uh, you know, way, different ways of encouraging people to speak more Mi'kmaq uh, at work so that we as a community can grow our understanding and use of the language. So that's things that we're looking to prioritize and move on in the next year. And then governance, uh, there's a lot of good work going on in governance. Uh, we have uh, examples of that when we're talking about the financial administration law, we're talking about land code development, we're talking about a housing policies. Uh, there's a lot of good work across almost every directorate uh, to develop the government. So that's the decision-making structures, clarification of organization charts, uh, who, 
who does what, who's responsible for what, how do we communicate with one another, how do we share information, how do we make decisions, uh, planning, budgeting, those are some of the things that we're working on and we're looking at how do we not only look at our governance structure here in Listigoch, but how do we collaborate with our sister and brother Mi'kmaq communities? How does that work together? How do we work with MMS? These are all things that we're working on and developing. Another update is the, um, there was a question, uh, and, and with the upcoming uh, nominations on April 20th, uh, there, there was, we heard a suggestion or we heard a, a comment that as of uh, the day after nominations, the chief and council is done. Um, just here to confirm that that's not the truth, that's not the way it works. Uh, the current administration is in until, uh, according to INAC, uh, up till June 7th. That allows for, even if there is a change, uh, it allows for that transition period so that uh, you can finish up your files, uh, close things off, hand your keys over, what have you. So, so as I was saying, yes, the, the mandate extends to the, the, the start of the next term. And there's even a bit of an overlap. Uh, some of the ongoing files that, uh, you know, because things do not stop, we do need to keep moving forward to certain things. Uh, some of the things we're looking at is uh, housing policy. Uh, Brian DeConti has been uh, working with our capital infrastructure housing department and uh, with Don Germain. They will continue to have community engagements. They will continue going out uh, and meeting with people, speaking with people to get the further clarification on, on what are the issues that you have in housing? What are the questions you have? What are suggestions, recommendations? There was one session that was held uh, last week, I believe, or was it the week before? Uh, Thursday before Good Friday, so that's the week before. So there was a, a session held then. They're looking to have another session. Um, anybody have a copy of that that we could hold up? I thought I had one here of that information. Yes. So that's the, the housing policy. So that's the information sheet that Brian DeConti, um, that's DNH Consultants, um, is working on with Don Germain here locally and working with our capital department. It goes back to something I believe was brought up at the first community meeting that we held during this administration. Next item that I have here is uh, moose hunting. So a while back, we, start, we did a little survey here during a, uh, a community meeting just to get a feel for whether or not uh, the community wanted us to start addressing the issues around moose hunting. Uh, that has, we have taken some steps and, and some interesting developments have happened. Uh, I met with the Grand Chief uh, in Ganawage to speak about uh, developing a protocol between our two communities into how we would access our, each other's territory if that was uh, something that we wanted to do. We know that some of their, uh, their members come here to hunt. Um, only right that if our members wanted to go there to hunt that there should be a way to do so. Uh, a protocol agreement that we have in place that's respectful of both, both nations. Uh, in that discussion, um, and, and that protocol, doesn't, protocol agreement doesn't exist, all we've agreed to at this point is a, a moratorium, a stop. So it's not happening while we have these discussions. Uh, an interesting spin-off that came out of it is we had visits, uh, we had uh, uh, visitors from uh, the other uh, Mi'kmaq communities of the 7th District uh, down as far as uh, Il Ground. Uh, the chief from uh, Elsie Buktuk uh, was supposed to come as well. We had uh, Burnt Church. Um, we had five different communities represented, uh, all sitting around the table and talking about wanting to develop a, a comprehensive or a collective approach to uh, managing our territory, managing our, our moose harvesting or hunting um, practices, uh, developing protocols between communities. So if we wanted to go hunt somewhere closer to Eel River Bar, how would we go about that? Or Eel River Bar come here, how would we do that? Uh, there was a common view of that this is Mi'kmaq territory, um, it, it, it belongs to all of us, um, but there is also a question or a, a, a need to respect one another as well. And so if you're going to go into the Medabinakiak territory, how would you do that? So reaching out, whether it be to their council or their chief or something like that. So it's something that we're looking to continue developing. 
Uh, we're not far, far along on it as far as I would like to be, but it's not something that we're going to shelve and put away either. It's something that we'd like to keep working on over the next few months. Uh, Zenibus update. So, Question. Okay, sure. Thanks for jumping in there. For your moose uh, hunting, you're going to have rangers up there from in the summertime to, or in the fall time to uh, watch these uh, poachers? That, that's definitely something uh, we've supported in the past. We've requested our rangers uh, to go up there the last two seasons, I believe, Peter, uh, to go up and, and monitor the activity. And it's something, again, that when we were speaking to the other communities, they said, how do we do that collectively so that we have uh, our own people monitoring from here all the way to the, the Miramichi River, right? And how do we, how do we collectively do that as, as Mi'kmaq people? So again, not very far along in the discussion, but definitely a, an interesting discussion and something that we should keep moving on and, and having our people up there uh, monitoring our territory. Good. So the question that uh, Kathy's reading out is, are non-natives going to be stopped from hunting in our community? So would that mean within our uh, reserve boundary, I guess? I mean, Uh, to me, that, that's part of, I, I, I sort of look more in the, you know, what's our primary area that we use. I'm not just look, talking about the, the reserve boundary, but the primary use area, I guess. Where do, our, where do we normally go hunting as, as Lustiguch Mi'kmaq? Um, we would have to determine how do we want to approach that as a community, right? Uh, what kind of law, what kind of enforcement, how would we go about doing that? Um, to me, that's something that we would have as a, have as a community discussion and develop as a community. So right, right now, non-natives can hunt? That they, no. non, well, non-natives have their own licensing structure. They, we oh, don't right. license or... In our territory, though. In our community. Not in our territory, no. They... <laughs> okay, it depends what... But the question was, is right, and, and it, it depends on what you define as territory. So there are non-native hunting rules, right? There are rules around that. So if they follow the rules that they have, then that's what they follow. We're talking about our own people, our own rules, right? Within our reserve boundaries. Within our reserve boundary, I don't think that should happen. But again... It's our reserve boundaries and our territory, because Aboriginal title rights do not have boundaries. We have here, we have a district, seventh district. That's our territory. Okay, we're talking about the actual reserve itself, reserve proper. Nobody's allowed to hunt there other than Mi'kmaq members. Within our territory, which is the Aboriginal or Treaty Right area, which was basically the seventh district, we're allowed to hunt anywhere along uh, in that territory, regardless of what. So as far as non-Indians come in to hunt in that territory off season, for them, they're not allowed to do that. So our, the question was, uh, I'm aware they're not allowed to do that, but will they be stopped was the question. Well, yeah, if we catch them or if our rangers catch them, yes, they will stop them and hopefully confiscate whatever it is they're using to hunt because they're breaking the law. Not only ours, but theirs also. Just a question from a viewer. Hey, thank you. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot more discussion that's needed around these topics. Dolly, you said you still had a comment, or is that... Uh, we just need the microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, we have a comment over here first, and then over to, Do over to Dolly next, Mike. Okay. I want to go back to uh, what Raymond was saying about our water. Uh, there's something that uh, it was interesting a few years back when I was uh, working with the CHRs. Uh, the mill over here, did everybody or anybody go and inspect that place and where the dumping the oils and all the waste that they're, they're using from that mill? And uh, I did go there myself in the back, the back part of it, and there is tires, oil tanks, oil, all kinds of stuff that's being dumped there. 
So I was wondering, because our water is so important, and uh, Lewis was just saying the uh, water runs through here, and I believe that because there's a brook down there too, eh? And there's one down below this way. And I was just wondering if anybody had tested the, those waters, because it's very important for the community to, uh, maybe that's why we're having so much uh, sickness and so much cancer and so many things that are happening to our community. Maybe that's all part of it, mm. the pollution that's in our waters. I just wanted to mention okay. that, and I just wanted to mention that mill, and somebody should go and check behind that mill mm -hmm. and see what's happening there. Okay. And they shouldn't be hunting in our territory anyway. <laughs> I just wanted a little clarity, um, Darcy, because when, when Kathy asked a question, it seemed to me that you were having a difficult time to answer whether or not the non-natives were able to hunt in our territory, and I think, yes. um, what's his name? Fred. Fred. <laughs> Fred uh, clarified it a little bit more. However, I, I do agree that, you know, this is uh, within our territory that non-natives, uh, we're, we're having a discussion here whether or not we should let our, uh, our brothers and sisters from, from other community, other native communities, aboriginal communities to hunt here, and then we're, we're having a hard time to answer the question, are non-natives allowed to hunt in our territory? Okay, I, I think that's, mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't go well with me. Um, and another thing is, is that it's not only uh, that the non-natives are hunting, but the non-native men, I mean the, the non-native men are using their uh, native wives or, or girlfriends or sons or daughters to bring them up there to mm -hmm. hunt. And that's a known fact. And I think that should be something that's on, on the table as well. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not her that's pulling the trigger, it's him. Okay. So you know, if if that's the case, he as a non-native has the right to go and and, and get the uh, the license and hunt in whatever territory mm -hmm. that he's allowed to hunt in. You know, he doesn't have to bring our women and children up to woods to get his uh, his game. Yeah. So just to clarify, the difficulty I had was with what do you mean by territory? That's that's the difficulty I have. I don't disagree with you at all. I think that. If you're talking about within our community territory, our, our woods, no, that, that to me is clear. But if you're talking outside that boundary, there are rules for non-native hunters that they need to follow. It's not up to us to say these are the rules for you as a non-native hunter in that area. So it's the definition of territory that I had trouble with, not, not the difference in perspective and view on hunting. Okay. That was my concern. Yep. Uh, I, this is more for Fred, I think. Uh, the lake road, is that a open road for everybody or is that a our territorial road? And if so, isn't it, can us as First Nations of the Mi'kmaq community put a stop don't let the non-natives pass through that road if it's our road, or is it that a shared public road going up the woods? Because that's how they get to the woods to go hunting. Have them go around Kemp Road, in, I mean not Kemp, uh, Laverne, instead of passing through our roads. Can we block them from going to stop, I mean kind of stop the way of non-natives hunting in our territory? We can deal with the uh, Hospem Road the same way we deal with the uh, bridge approach. It's reserved land. Uh, we, we can pass any laws that we want to pass and regulate in it. So if you do decide that you want to block it off from non-members, it can be done. You know, As I said, it's Aboriginal title lands. It's our land. It's our laws that will be applying. Good. Okay, Madeline. How about when uh, native people come over, like, like let's say Mohawks come over to our reserve, 
and they go want, want to go hunting, are they going to be allowed? Because we talked about that last year, mm -hmm. and uh, there were some Mohawks up in the woods, and they were hunting. And what we uh, had talked about was maybe because uh, just bring one, just kill one moose instead of more than one, instead of two, three of them. I don't know how that's going to work out. Is that going to be allowable to other Native people to come over here and uh, hunt for moose? So right now we have a protocol agreement with uh, Gunawage from the, with the Grand Chief from Gunawage, uh, and we're working on what that would look like. In the meantime, it's a moratorium, Madeline, so it's no, like none, none whatsoever either way. Uh, but if we do develop an agreement, it would be with, uh, you know, what's our rules, what's our expectation, and they would, re I think, you know, they would have to respect our expectations. So if the community said that you won and that's it, then that's, that's what it is. But it, the same rules would also apply if we went to their territory. So we could make the same request of them. So. Just a quick comment, just to follow up from Madeline, what you're, what you're talking about and when you're saying, I think part of the discussion too, when we're talking about creating our own laws and how the community would want it is, um, we're talking about uh, abuse too with hunting. So if we're talking about outside community members coming in to take one moose, then we also have to look at ourselves also and look at um, what are we focusing, so are we gonna not kill the, the feet, you know, the cows, are we gonna just stick with the bulls and how are we gonna, do that. So that was part of the discussions too that we had at the community meeting is we also have to take a look at ourselves on how we're going to control this before. And that's why we put the moratorium, I think, first to say we're going to stop everybody from the outside and we'll hear what everybody has to say within the community and how, how do they want to go from there. Good. Okay, thank you, great, great questions and suggestions. Uh, the next up, uh, just regarding Xenobus, I received a question uh, yesterday, I believe it was, um, asking if we had converted uh, the, the, the loan to shares. No, we have not. Uh, the, uh, the Economic Development Department is still working with, uh, with professionals in that area to, to look at what the structure would look like, uh, legal um, to, to do that, uh, negotiation strategy, and setting up meetings with, um, with Zenibus to talk about what type of agreements could be set up in addition to a shareholders agreement. So we know that a shareholders agreement would be with the parent company, but we could also set up local agreements with the facility across, and they wouldn't necessarily have to be the same agreement. They could be two separate agreements. So that's where ECDEV is. Uh, if Delphine was here, she could probably explain a little bit more in detail of what's happening, uh, but that's a brief overview of where we are with the file on that in terms of the investment. Uh, we do, however, have um, a couple more people that have started working there. Uh, one is en route to becoming an assistant person in charge, which is great. A uh, young fella that uh, started work there a few months ago. And we have uh, four students from our horticulture program that's being offered here in LMDC that will be doing a work placement there in the, in the coming weeks. So there's some, the opportunities are growing and, and improving um, as, as they continue to uh, move along. That, that, that's fine, Sherry. Uh, the, 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 no, well, that, that's, the, that's the key going forward. Uh, thank you very much for that. Appreciate them. Um, you speak of the Cenebis investment. As a community member, what, what are we getting out of, out of this investment that you're proposing? And it was noted on Facebook that I think it was Sky that had mentioned it was a community that okayed this $3 million. I was not at a meeting that said, okay, you can get $3 million. So just help me understand this investment. What are we getting out of it as a community in general? Like what's it used for? So right now we are gaining 5% interest on that $3 million. That's what we're getting right now. What we would get as a community going forward depends on the type of agreements that we would sign with the parent company or with the, 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 um, the company across the street from us, or across the river from us, sorry. So I can't tell you what we would get exactly out of that. So far, 
Uh, we do have training opportunities that are presenting themselves for our students that are taking horticulture. We do have people that are starting work in that environment. Uh, there has been talk of apprenticeship opportunities with regards to the specific types of construction that are needed for the build out of the, of the facility. It is um, quite technical, but we know we have the people that can do it, especially if they learn from the expertise that's there now. Um, but these are things that would be worked into a future agreement. Um, <laughs> a lot of bucks. So, and I don't think 5% is valid to a $3 million meal, which they're going to grow higher because the stock market for Cenebis, you know right now, I, no, I shouldn't say that, but mm -hmm. it's that on a stock market, it's growing and growing and, and everybody's jumping in on it because, and we're 5%. And then you speak of training, I don't know if you're aware of that Cenebis is offering the training at the CCNB in Camelton in French only. Why aren't we part of that program? And they're paying their education to be there. They're paying for all their training. Like, what's wrong with our people? You have, what, four or five people there right now? So I, I don't know if that was part of an agreement that maybe chief and council should jump on, that we should be part of that agreement with Cinebis. Why are they only offering this program in French to the non-native people? And my next question is, can you explain to me what's going on? Does Camelton have money in that they're having this Cinebis party on the weekend that first 150 people get chicken wings? Or that's not... I, that's news of ours. I, but it's I, out I, there. I, it, it is publicized. I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know what it's that last company. part. It's a private company. Um, but I can speak to the other two questions for sure. Uh, I can assure you if there's a chicken wing thing, we would not be excluded. Okay? You, you, we could get our chicken wings too. Yeah. Um, but be, be, besides that, Sherry, um, just for clarity, right? Right now it is just $3 million loan with 5% interest, okay? It's not, we're, we don't own shares. If we were to own shares, those shares would be growing with the value of Xenobis, which is the benefit of converting to shares because the company has grown in value since we first loaned them the money, but our loan has not grown as fast as the company has. Had we converted to shares initially, our share, the value of our shares would have grown as the company had grown. It would be significantly more than $3 million right now. We'd probably be looking at, I, I, I don't wanna do the math, probably $30 million value right now. Um, the training aspect, it is not Xenobis that is offering the training, it is CCNB that is offering the training. We, we, we know that it's to get people in uh, for them working, right? We know that CCMB is primarily a French program, but we started a cohort. We started our own training here in Listigouch long before that. We have 11 graduates from an ACMPR course from our own community that we invested in over uh, about a year ago. So most of those 11 graduates have gone on and had an opportunity at Xenobis so far. We also have a horticulture program that has, I believe, uh, 15 students that are taking that, 10 to 15 students which again, we started in October, and, and those now are, should be finishing up their program around the same time and have the same opportunity to go work. They don't have to, I mean, they're learning how to grow anything. Uh, they can work in our community garden, they could make greenhouses, they could start their own uh, floral shop, uh, become landscapers, but they can also grow, right? At, at Zenibus, so the opportunities would be there for them as well. We are also working to, um, and I, I just got this update yesterday from LMDC, that they're working on another training program that would be offered here in the community. We have a high number of interests. We've had 27 people uh, minimum that have expressed an interest in another training opportunity that would be in and around a three month uh, training that would be uh, four, and this is very preliminary, but four weeks um, rules, regulations, four weeks of uh, learning to grow, and then a four-week placement. So we're looking at how do we bring that here to Listigouch for our members to make sure that we can maximize the opportunity for our members should they choose to work in that industry. 
And irregardless of whether we have a shareholders agreement or a local agreement, our people will still be trained and still have that as a choice if they would like to work there or in Moncton or in Ontario or BC or Nova Scotia, wherever a facility may be, wherever a licensed producer may be. They'll have that, that flexibility to go work anywhere. So, I always encourage our community members to stay here and work here, right? I mean, that's what we want. That's why we invest and train them. Um, but they're not stuck. The choice is theirs. The, the, there's a lot of opportunity for them going forward after graduating from that program. So that, that's why we have not gone that direction, because we've created our own, and we're ahead of the game. Step ahead of yeah. CMB. How strongly does Chief and Council uh, feel about this sentence? Are you for or against it? Myself? Yeah. I think it's a good move. It's a good move. Yeah. Okay, with that being asked, uh, I'm being asked to ask a question. If our community is lending money for a marijuana operation, yet reprimanding uh, potential employees for using marijuana, mm -hmm. you know, that's like a double-edged sword here. You're, you're for it and you're, you're paying for it, or, or at least you're investing in it or, or putting mm -hmm. money towards it, but don't touch it. That's, that's not necessarily accurate, right? <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. And, and I'll clarify, right? So there, you, you are looking at an investment. We're talking about an economic opportunity, right? And that, that's one side of it. But you're also talking about the requirements of, of, a, work, um, of, of a workplace, right? So there, each and every workplace has certain requirements that you need to meet, right? So that's one, one aspect. And it may seem contradictory, but there, the investment is an investment. The workplace requirements are the workplace requirements. If you take somebody, I don't know much about marijuana, I'm not a marijuana smoker mm -hmm. uh, myself. However, if you take somebody that is smoking marijuana, who smoked a joint two days ago, and goes for a test next week or next month, it's gonna show up in their system. Yes. Okay? They're gonna go to work next month. They haven't smoked in two weeks, three weeks, whatever, okay? Yet, you take somebody who drank alcohol last night, and has to go to work tomorrow morning, they're still under the influence. Whereas the marijuana smoker had smoked a joint at mm -hmm. uh, two o'clock in the afternoon and he has to go to work at midnight, that's long gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. so, and uh, marijuana is going to be legalized in, in, in yes. a couple of months, yet our community members, our fishers are being reprimanded. Not I, I, under, I understand the, the, the safety aspect yep. of it all, However, uh, I think everybody in here knows a little bit about marijuana. I don't know very much about it, but I know if you smoke a joint this morning, you're not going to be high tonight at this meeting. That mm -hmm. I know for mm -hmm. a fact. So uh, on behalf of the fishermen, I, you know, like, I would like for you guys to answer that. And you know, why go to such a drastic measure is to make such big holes in their heads. I've seen pictures and, and, and that was, like I was insulted and, and, and I was, uh, my tears came down my eyes on how our community members were being treated. These are our people. We invested in them as a community, not only chief and council, mm -hmm. we invested in, in these uh, men and women. We believed in them. They bring in the money, the own source. How much money did fisheries bring in? Just crabbing alone. I'm told over $18 million. That's these fishermen. Mm -hmm. And days before they're about to work, I'm sorry, hand in your keys and your vest or your bodysuit, whatever it is, mm -hmm. your life preserver, because you cannot go on the boat. I was personally affected by that. Not because my husband fishes or, or, or out there, but because of the way they were treated. It's almost inhumane. Some of the pictures that I saw with, with their big bald spots in the back of their heads. That went around our community. What does that say for the, the people that did it? And, and the people that okayed it? 
And we know, we know as a community that there are people in the workforce here that have me, uh, medical prescriptions and that are still working. You know, there's a difference there. You know, that somebody's going to take a drink tonight and, and it's going to drink all night long and, and, and take uh, cocaine or crack or whatever and take Percocets and then go to work next week. They're strung out. And the people that are getting off the boats, when they get home, they don't get much time off. They get two, three days, uh, if, if that, or just enough time to go home and shower and, and wash their clothes and go back. And they're going to relax by, by taking a, uh, a joint or whatever, marijuana. And then the one one's getting off the boat and is going home to drink and sniff, sniff Percocets and everything else and is going to go back to work. Who's, who's putting who at risk here? You know? I'm really, really, um, I, I don't even know what to say. And if it would be, I would be ashamed, honestly, I would be ashamed to stand behind that. As a community member, uh, I'm not here as anybody else tonight. I'm not, uh, nobody sent me here. I came here on my own free will because I care for our fishers. I care for our community members. Mm -hmm. I care what happens to them because it's not only the fisherman uh, or the fisherwoman that's being affected, it's their whole family. That's their livelihood. You know, some of them put 20, 30 years into that. 18 years. Mm -hmm. 18 years. And you know, there, somebody was mentioning, I don't know, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they were saying, well, okay, if, you, if the fishermen uh, retaliate and, and if they stand up for themselves, well, they're gonna put non-natives on the boat. No Do way. they remember no. what some of these fishers went through when we had non-native captains? No. No, no. When non-native captains were urinating in front of our women? And, and, the, condi and the conditions that, that our fishers had to endure during those times? No. I was never on those boats, but I heard the stories. Mm -hmm. I hear them, and I feel for them. And for somebody to say that they're making too much money, well, they're making that money for our community. They're bringing the money in for us. And we should respect them. Yes. And we should even pay them more than what they're being paid, rather than trying to discourage them from going back year after year because their percentage goes up. Thank you, You're welcome. Because they risked their lives out there. You know, we lost one of our own. Mm -hmm. And that could happen in, in, in a moment's notice. It can happen to any one mm -hmm. of them. So let's stand behind our men and women of, of our community. Not only the fishers, every working person in our community. You know, let, let, let's, let's think about what <laughs> marijuana, if somebody's saying that that's, that's the root of all evil, they missed the boat, mm -hmm. <laughs> literally, you know? Yep. So, you know, like this is, you know, I came here, that's a positive message from me. That's, those are my feelings personally. Mm -hmm. Let's show some respect. The three million dollars that was given to Zenibus, they're showing more respect than the, the eighteen million that are uh, the, the, the eighteen million that are uh, just the crabbers brought in. That's not including the uh, the shrimp and uh, everything else. And to turn around and and, and to my understanding, that uh, one point some million of their quota was sold. Of of this year's of this year's quota? Yeah. Not at all. It was sold. It was sold. It was sold. Just 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 hang. We're never allowed to talk about fisheries, and what happens is when it's Hey hang on, Holly. I, I don't mean to disrespect you, Holly. It's just uh we we we've asked that people use the microphone to speak. That's that's all, Holly. I just want to say one thing. I have a question. 
you, chief, and council decided to target certain individuals. I don't agree on the cannabis plant at all because I don't do drugs, right? Period. Anyway, I find that very hypocritical. You want to know why? Because every time I speak up, I got blackballed. I didn't work this year, and I don't care. Blackball me all you want, but I'm going to say my, my truth, okay? You shouldn't be targeting just certain individuals in one section, one sector, fisheries, right? Because they do bring in a lot of money. And like Dolly said, a little bit of pot here and there to relax them, I guess. You know, some people don't, all, not everybody does drugs. Not all fishermen do pills and drugs and cocaine and that. Yeah, they might smoke a little pot. That's their thing, I guess. Maybe it's okay for them. But you, chief and council, I believe that it's very hypocritical that you only target them, fisheries. When I believe that if you want to talk about fairness, as chief and council, I think that if you're going to do it to one, you do it to all. And I believe that your leaders in this community, you should be the first ones to take drug tests. And not only chief and council, but every department. To me, that's fair. Because I didn't work this year, I don't know why, I signed up and I've been rejected over and over. And I don't know why, because maybe I spoke up last year against drugs in this community. Well, let me tell you something. There's another truth for you right here, okay? There's worse things going on in this reserve that you people don't want to see or don't want to admit. Chief Darcy, you were there mm -hmm. the day of my walk when I was walking. When I got in front of your house, a certain individual was in the middle of the road. No clothes on, just jeans, no shoes, no socks, full of blood. You seen him, I saw him. I didn't approach him, neither did you, because I knew he was psychotic, okay? Psychotic episode. Your father came out, and I don't know what his intentions were, but I told him, don't touch him. He's sick, okay? So this guy is heavy on drugs, and I suspect he's taken probably taking um, the stuff that's going around there, uh, cheap stuff, I forget what it is. Speed, this is what's going around in our community now. You can't do anything when you're on speed. You know what I mean? You're, you're, just, you're just so messed up. I also want to mention that I've worked on housing for 12 years, okay? And I've witnessed a lot. I've worked with guys that were so high, so drunk, that endangered my life. Operating machinery, climbing up and down the station, working on the roofs. They've been many injuries, you guys know that. But are they being targeted also to take a drug test? No. And they should be. Because I know what goes on in the workforce. I've been there and I've seen it firsthand. But I'm not allowed to say anything because I'll get blackballed. But you know what? You people don't intimidate me. And I don't care what titles you carry. I don't, think, I don't care how smart you think you are. You're not going to intimidate me. In fact, I'm going to fight this drug issue in this community with your help or without it. Because it's time you people wake up. That young man could have died that day if I hadn't stopped to help him. It seemed like nobody else cared. Cars were just driving by like, whoo hoo, look at this nut. He's not a nut, he's a human being. People are dying on this reserve faster than you can blink an eye. Through drugs, heavy drugs. And I'm talking about cocaine, I'm talking about the shit that's going around. So I'm telling you now, you're sitting there and you think you're all self-righteous and you can just target a certain bunch of people that bring in a lot of money into this community a lot of money for people like me can work. If I ever get chosen to work, that is. But that's all right, I'm surviving. Anyway, I believe, Chief and Council, you need 
to respect the community. You need, if you're going to target one, the fishermen only, fisherwomen, I don't think that's fair. And, and you all know it's not fair. You know it's not fair. I'd like to see you, Chief and Council, step up and do a drug test. You want to run a clean ship? Be the leaders. That's all I got to say. Thank you. I just have a uh, comment. Oh, my bad. Karma? So we've been asking for a long time to have um, a staff meeting. We've been asking to have meetings with you guys to talk about what's going on as far as the um, drug testing was concerned. Um, Kathy tried to put it on the table. It was absolute, you guys said absolutely not, that you guys weren't going to talk to us. Fine, you don't want to talk to us. You guys took the hair follicle testing. I don't even know who decided to do that. Do you guys have any idea who decided to change it from urinalysis to hair testing? Could you tell me that first? It was done in uh, collaboration with uh, the people that did the testing. So you would have uh, the people that are involved in the lab aspect, you would have our medical center and you would have our HR department that all collaborated and fisheries talk about how will we be able to get the most uh, accurate results without being the most invasive. We know that there was a lot of complaints made last year about using urine and, and, and that stuff. So that, that was how they tried to address it. I spoke with um, a, a couple of the nurses. When I first went in to test for one, one of the nurses was sitting off to the side of the room, like way off to the side of the room. The second time I went in, because they didn't take enough of my hair the first time, so I had to go back. So um, I go back and it was the nurse that had been sitting off to the side. I asked her, I said, why that day were you sitting off to the side? Was something wrong? She said, yeah, she was sick and tired of everybody screaming and hollering and swearing. And she, as a nurse, didn't feel that it, she had to be um, sitting around and doing this for a living to listen to everybody. And it was the fishermen complaining, what was, which is what was going on. She said that um, if it happened again, that she wasn't going to uh, uh, carry out the um, contract with fisheries, that she wouldn't do the drug testing at all. She said that uh, she could see clearly that there was no uh, communication between the office and the staff, and she could see what the problems were, but it wasn't on her to decide or to fix or to listen to. So she was telling Rose in front of me that um, she's hoping that they do... Um, to, to, the, she's hoping they all get together and talk about how it went to see if they'd go back to your analysis and hoping that the nurse's input would be considered because they thought it was a nightmare, this whole hair thing, right? So I heard somebody mention earlier that someone was getting uh, their hair chopped off. It was getting hacked off so bad, and I've got pictures here if anybody wants to see. It was so bad that I'd say it's the size of nickels that they were taking off some of the men, some of the women as well, and then it's supposed to be 125 hair three different spots on some people and circles about that big of their hair gone. Now we're getting scalped by our own people. How fun, how fun is that? And who the hell det determined what safety sensitive positions would be receiving this to begin with? What happened to the people who are operating heavy equipment on the reserve? Or like she was saying with the people that she's experienced on the job site who are high and drunk. Before you guys did this, you know what we used to do? We used to come across people who were all messed up on the job site, on the boats. We deal with it. We wouldn't allow them on the boats. We wouldn't work with them because we don't want to get hurt. We've been taking care of ourselves for the last 16 years before this. So it's two years of you guys taking care of us. It's created a huge mess. Then you guys turn around and you take our money. Why? I still don't understand why you took our money. All those years, you guys were paying white people. They came in and they said, this is how you pay uh, deckhands. It ranges between 2.5% and 5% being someone who would who'd be really experienced. So, and I know this because my sister ran fisheries for a while. They paid the white people like that. The captains would come in, they would say, I have three deckhands, I have a mechanic and two deckhands. These deckhands have X amount of years experience, you pay them this much and that much. And they were paid. The mechanics were paid. Now all of a sudden, you know what my sister says? I have experienced and educated fishers. Mi'kmaq, experienced, educated fishers. Why the hell am I paying these white people when I could be paying my own people? <laughs> then you guys come in here, 
And you take our money. Why? I still don't understand why. Sky answered me one day on Facebook. He said that it was because um, they were using the money to repair the, uh, the vessels. Are you out of your freaking mind? Seriously? That was one potential answer. Another one that Fred gave us was that they were purchasing an $8 million shrimp vessel. The Okchit and the, and the Migwi Datum are brand new vessels that we ourselves commissioned. $1.25 million they cost. Brand spanking new. He wanted to buy an $8 million vessel. On what planet? And with our money? You guys got to sincerely start looking at what you're doing. You're doing this to your own people. Why? Why was the cut? Why did you take our money? I want to know why. I passed my drug test. Tell me why. I think I'm entitled to know why. Don't everybody jump. I'll make it uh, brief. It was just a comment regarding uh, the drugs and what Karen was saying, uh, Holly was saying, Karma, what you're saying too. Um, I could wear a few different hats, but I'll, I'll definitely respond to this. Um, when, when the information was coming forward just the other day at our last council meeting, we, is there feedback or? It's okay? I thought it was getting feedback. Um, it was actually me and Sheila, we were having a good conversation um, talking about, um, let's say when you're getting drug tested and you know, let's say if it is, or, or Dolly was saying, if, um, if you are gonna, let's say, uh, test positive for marijuana, um, how do, you, how do you go from there? So it would, I would say it would be different from, let's say, somebody testing positive for cocaine. You know, um, like you said, marijuana is, is going to be legalized. It's on its way. But I think, I think the other part is if, if it's, it's a safety-sensitive issue, and it's also, I believe, when, I, when it was told to me, pre-screening. So, of course, it's anywhere that you would start a new job, but any testing after that should only be either... Um, Let's say if somebody reports something that this person's, let's say, impaired or something like that, or let's say a captain or another fisherman say they think something's up, or let's say on the job site, then I think it would go a little bit further where they, where they can be tested. But uh, my understanding was the pre-screening, but we got into the conversation of, because when I, was a, when I was a police officer, I took a drug training. And when we took drug training, you get exposed to all these different amounts of drugs. And when I say that, you're in a classroom and you... You're exposed to, let's say, cocaine, you're exposed to heroin, you're exposed to marijuana, all these different things. So when you go before the court, you can actually testify and say, well, I know this personally because this is the course that I was on. And when I say when we're in there, it's not that we're actually doing drugs, it's actually that we may be contaminated with it. Now, the reason why I'm saying this part is because there were a lot of big agencies that are with us on this court, uh, I mean, this course, like, let's say, uh, Waterloo, uh, Hamilton, Toronto Police, all these different ones who get, just like us, we would get random drug testing when we come back. So we would have tested positive for all these drugs. But the testing, and I think maybe it should be applied or put into this, uh, this thing, is that there's a difference between testing positive and like a quantitative, quantitative analysis. So that way, when we went back to our department, it says, well, yes, there, there's tracings amounts in there, but not enough for this person that he actually consumed it or this person that was under the influence of it. So let's say um, you get a person that, like you said, uh, I think the conversation was, let's say he came home on the weekend and has, and, and has their marijuana, right? Well, there will probably be different levels compared to being intoxicated. So maybe that's a different avenue that, that can be even looked upon. So that way it's not, let's say, labeling somebody compared to, you know, like, because if, if uh, I think Sheila was saying, like, if you, if you test positive on something, you're almost, um, you could be labeled as if uh, you're, you're an addict, right? Um, and then maybe having to follow those steps. So, so let's say if this policy is in there and, and, it, and, it, and it is working, well, these are some of the, the things we we're talking about. So how do we... How do we do it where we, we make sure that the people that are working, and it shouldn't just be selective, it should be, let's say, all across the board for people who are driving buses, people who are policing, people who are um, with kids and everything like that. So that way, we know that, but it's also, you also have to realize too with, uh, that we're not breaching any charter of rights. So if, if there is information that a person may be under the influence or may be driving a certain way or 
you know, possibly uh, falling that they should be followed up on. They should be checked upon. You never know if they're under the influence or maybe they're diabetic. So there's a way we have to, to check right away. But I think if, if we look at it that way, because myself, um, I'm not about to target anybody, you know, as a police officer. I mean, I, I would have loved to have dealt with anybody who was smoking weed their whole time than drinking whiskey on calls. You know, I never had any issues. You know, they say alcohol is a big problem. Yes, but I mean, there's a lot of people too that, that use this that are, I wouldn't say self-medicating, but are actually using it for pain or trying to get off opiates or, or other addictions. You know, there, there are different ways. But I think it's the, the, the focus point and is the, the pre-screening aspect and just the safety without having to punish people if, the, if they have this, but there, there, there has to be, you know, like it, it has to be worked upon. I, I agree it's, you know, it's, it's viewed as, as being wrong, but in another, another way, I also see it as everybody else would like to see it too, that, that we are safe. You know, you don't want to have people's jobs taken away. I don't, I don't believe that was uh, the point at all or anything, but, but, but I understand it also that, um, that how, how do we do it. And, and I mean, the last council meeting, there were really good discussions and we actually had some really good updates too from our executive director's office, from our senior director's office, I should say. I don't know what the, uh, the term is, Donna, but uh, I'll, go, I'll go with that. Um, yeah, and so, so that was maybe one part of it on the way we handled police officers coming back that may have some contaminants, but to show that they're not mm -hmm. addicted or they're not abusing it or anything, that it, it, it may come up, but it's not at a level where it's going to jeopardize their job or anything like that. So maybe that's a part of it, um, and we did bring it up forward. I think the conversation has to go a little bit more. Um, the other aspect, um, I know exactly who you're talking about. I'm not going to say anything about the individual out there or, or label him as uh, an addict or or anything like that. Um, my main concern is another big issue that we're dealing with, and I mean, one of the reasons why we have a, uh, a worker, a Jordan's principal worker, who's working under Circle of Care is to make sure that there's no gaps in services. So, I mean, we had a great presentation from Sarah Swazen, who's a Jordan's principal worker within the community, and if you don't know what the laws are, it's basically, you know, real quick, there was, uh, you know, um, a boy who died um, waiting to receive uh, treatment and the governments were battling jurisdictions who's going to pay for what and then you know unfortunate this uh, this youth passed our area here even before i got into council we we, we started these uh integrated service delivery uh meet, you know how, how do we get our people from the community access to mental health services health services anything extra within new brunswick well there's still that barrier because if we have a quebec medicare card you know, they won't take us over there. They would say, well, you have to go back to the Quebec side. You have to do this, you have to do that. And I knew right away when I heard that this individual in the community who I think needs help, you know, um, desperately. And when the doctors took care of him over there, I shouldn't even say take care of him. He was released two days later, you know. So I think the thing that we're focusing on here is, is, is that part of the discrimination re regarding just because of a, uh, a barrier but it's the services that we need access to within our community also. But my first part was definitely the drug thing, I feel, but I also, I see the other side to it too, but how, how do we come to that, to that middle where everybody's protected without infringing on everybody's rights, but understanding the reason behind it. Um, the second part is, yeah, for, for the drugs, I mean, Carmel, you, 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 you said it straight there, you know, um, if anybody here, you know, give it, give it to the police, give it, give it to them, uh, any, any information, you know, you don't want to talk to them, talk to me, I'll bring it forward. It doesn't matter. You know, I'm, I'm still connected with that in some way, but, um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to voice that, um, definitely not target anybody, but definitely understand and the support that is needed, but there, there has to be a way to, uh, to help all parties. So I just wanted to, to state that. I'm not sure. I think Mike has it with Anna Isaac next. Yeah. Anna, and I don't know who the next ones are. I have Dolly and Karen. Two very direct questions that hopefully we can get a direct answer to, to follow up on the commentary of three that the three of our women just made. One, how do you explain or justify that of 44 safety sensitive positions identified in the LMGHR policy, only two the Fishers and the Rangers are subjected 
to drug and alcohol pre-screening? How do you justify or explain that bias? Second question, of the fishers, the shrimpers aren't capped, the crabbers are. How do you justify or explain that of all the returning seasonal workers in Listiguch, whether they're fishermen, public works, only the crabbers are capped? So there's two very direct questions that I would appreciate direct answers to, please. So uh, Lloyd is, is uh, uh, saying something to me as well that, that clarifies a little bit of the first question, with the, which is uh, the safety-sensitive positions. Uh, he said that it's not just the rangers and not just the, um, the, the fishermen that are pre-screened. It would be any of the safety-sensitive positions, including our police officers. The difference here is the pre-screening. Uh, it is a pre-employment screening. And that, that's the major difference. So I know a lot of... Uh, um, yes. 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 Okay. I'm trying to respectfully answer your question, Anna. And I would, I would expect the same. Um, so what the key here is pre-screening, and I'll explain that to you. Um, it's pre a pre-employment condition. Okay, that that's the difference. So if it is a new worker at the chipper, they would have, they should be screened. Okay, they, if they're safety sensitive, and they're going. Okay, if it is public works working with machinery, the same thing. It should be pre-employment screening. If they are not, that it, I'm, yes. And if they're, and if they're not, we will look into that and we will make sure that that's looked into. There is, as Lloyd was just saying, there is no attempt to target any specific, I can't talk to you. There is no attempt to target, there's none. The other thing is when you talk about pre-employment or sorry pre-employment or pre-employment screening and how would that apply to chief and council we've looked into that there was a motion at the table that was presented by Chris uh, we supported that we looked into that again it is a it would have to be a precondition it would have to be something that you know going into you're going to have to pass so it wasn't something that we could implement in the middle of the term but it is something that could be put into future requirements for chief and council. That, that would be the difference because it, you know going in, if that is one of the conditions, you know that whenever you're going for nomination, you know that if you are successful in your candidacy, that you could be drug tested. So that would be a one, one way to do it. It has to be a pre-employment condition or a, what's that? I volunteered. Sheila volunteered. That, that, Sheila yes, volunteered. That, the, the volunteering the part was not a problem. The volunteering part was not a problem. It was the how would we be able to make that happen, right? So it would have to be something that is part of... Um, that, that's not a problem. It, we, we can mandate for the next... We can mandate that for the next term. That's not a problem. It ha as long as it is something that is stated before, before, right? So people understand, just as with our drug testing practices now. Uh, just for points of clarity, um, and if I'm, if I'm a little bit off here, uh, please, you know, I don't mind being corrected. Um, notice is sent well ahead of time to, our, to those that will be screened. It is sent a uh, minimum two months in advance, I believe, that this will be coming, that this test will be there. <laughs> Anna, I, I did it. I, no, I, I addressed that twice already now. 
Okay. Okay, so that, like I said, I, like I said, if that is occurring, it, we will look into it and address that. I'm not well aware that that's occurring. My understanding, oh, if we talk about the, um, the 40-something programs, and I agree with that, the, um, from my understanding, it's not coming from chief and council. That's actually up to the directorates to impose those. No, no, I'm just talking about if, I'm not, I'm not saying what you're saying, I'm not going against that. What I'm saying is also, if you look at how many directorates are participating in this and the ones that are actually, when, they, when they're doing new hiring or hiring new contracts, it's actually up to the directorates to follow that policy and to implement this pre-screening process, if I'm not mistaken. And if anybody wants to, well, if the, I'm just telling you exactly the steps for management, right? And if there's a chain of command from there, of course, we, we can definitely find out why it was actually brought up the other day. Why aren't the other ones getting screened? I have a question in regards to the pre-screening process for the fishermen. Where in the policy and where does HR have the right to um, oppose a doctor's medical marijuana prescription when some of the fishermen did test positive, it was just for THC, and I'm well aware that they do have a medical marijuana prescription, when they were advised by some of the council members where to even get their medical prescription in Moncton. So why are they being targeted also without any employment? They have to come back and get tested again when what, the season's gonna be half over? Then they're, not, they're gonna be out of a job or just halfway through the season or a quarter of the season? So where, where, where are their rights when they have a prescription from a doctor? So now we're allowed to override doctor's prescriptions? Um, so I, I did ask that question to HR. Um, what they've been doing is relying on the doctor of the person that, sent the, that, that prescribed to say specifically what is it prescribed for. So let's, let's, say, let's say, Summer, that it's uh, because, let's say you are a fisherman. Let's say that you have a... Um, bad shoulder, right? And that's why you use, uh, I'm just using you as an example, right? So you use medical marijuana, you've been prescribed because you have a bad shoulder. The problem now isn't necessarily the fact that you use medical marijuana, it's the shoulder. What, can you perform your job duties with a bad shoulder? How bad would that be? That's the way I understand it from HR. They are seeking clarification from the doctors. It's not about going above the doctor, it's about clarification from the doctor. HR is not making that decision. They're looking for medical clearance from the doctor to say they are okay to work because of that impairment or that impingement or that hurt shoulder or whatever the, the reason for the prescription might be. That, that is the clarification that's being sought medically. It's not overriding a doctor, it's looking for clarification from a doctor. I, I believe those conversations are being had with the fishermen. If, if I'm not, then, I, but I believe those conversations are being had. Again, I just wanna say, um, we came here tonight, try to keep an open mind, and um, your investment with the cannabis plant, which I know you are determined to wanna pass this um, medical marijuana facility, um, but at the same time, I find it very hypocritical because once they start distributing marijuana, medical or whatever, you're not allowed to smoke it. And if you do smoke it, you ain't allowed to work. So how does that go? I mean, like, you're going to target certain people again because some might need it for their sickness, for whatever ails them or whatever whatever they're going through, some people do need it for their PTSD or the pain that they're experiencing. And if they have a medical marijuana card and they're also working in the field, let's say fisheries, carpentry, whatever, and they bring in a, a lot of money to this community, but at the same time, there's restrictions. Well, okay, you have a medical marijuana card, but then again, sorry, we're doing a drug test on you, and you failed because you're smoking pot. That doesn't sit well with me. 
or with anybody. You're missing the, the point. Okay? If you're going to invest in something, it's supposed to create jobs, but you're going to see half of Adelville working in Camelton, maybe a handful of Listowich, I believe that. But at the same time, if you're going to smoke, you'll be penalized. You won't be able to work. So I don't understand why you want to invest, and at the same time you're testing and targeting only fisheries to go for this drug test, and when they fail, you take away their jobs. What's going to happen once we settle with the cannabis and people start coming off, people who work have jobs every day and they need to smoke their medical marijuana. And then when it comes time for seasonal work, are you going to test these people and then, oh, I'm sorry, but uh, you failed the test. You ever consider that? You ever think about that? What's going to happen to our people when this cannabis thing takes over? Drugs are drugs, okay? Whether you people want to hear it or not. You should be more concerned about your children and your grandchildren that are growing up, watching you, role models, you know? You should be watching over them because drugs are everywhere. Drugs are everywhere, and they've come to kill us. And you should be more concerned, in my opinion, you should be more concerned of what's really going on in this community that's worse than medical marijuana, it's worse than marijuana, to see what's really destroying our people here. And stop picking on the people who bring in your revenue. And like I said before, you want to be good leaders, you be the first one to step up the plate. And all every other department that works in Listowich should do the same. Same with the carpenters. And of course, public works. You want to be fair? Be fair. Be fair to everyone. That's why you're getting a lot of angry people here tonight. I understand why. But you got to stop and think. Our people here are suffering from drugs and alcohol. And if you want to blackball me again this year, like I said, that's fine. But I'm not going to stop fighting. I have a cause, I have a voice, and I'll use it. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don Germain, and I do a lot uh, of work in the community on different outreach and uh, uh, community-related programs. So I just have to say this turnout tonight is really fantastic. I mean, I'm used to having a lot of different community meetings for a lot of different reasons, and to have 100-something people here, that's, uh, I mean, I applaud you all for being so engaged uh, and wanting to, you know, come and learn and share your opinions. Um, so I'm going to actually speak to you today from somebody who's got a lot of knowledge on a lot of different community initiatives, including the uh, HR drug testing policy. I did have to do a lot of research on that because I was actually the moderator for that community discussion when it first rolled out. So from what I understand, the HR policy, as uh, Anna alluded, it does target more work groups than just fisheries and rangers. Um, and it's for pre-employment screening. So it means any new hires, right? So existing employees of the LMG who fall into any of those uh, uh, danger identified workplaces like uh, rangers, fishers, carpenters, uh, anybody who works with children, um, firefighters, police officers, anybody who gets a, a new job at LMG will now have to do a pre-employment testing. They get 30 days notice. I know, Anna, just, like, just bear with me, hon. Just bear with me. They get 30 days notice to uh, let them know that their test will be happening. And then once they pass that test, they're free for employment. They use the term random testing a few times up here. And I think that's just a misunderstanding. It's not called random. Random testing is illegal in Canada. It's called unannounced testing. So during the time that you are employed, you can be called to be tested again if there is reason to suspect you are under the influence in that moment, right there. You're at work right now, drunk, on drugs, something, right? 
and it's not just one person, it's two of your supervisors have to decide that your behavior is a little suspicious and it needs to get tested. So, but if you give your employer no reason to suspect you, then you will not be tested again for the rest of your work employment, right? Now, I think some of the language that's being used here, especially when we talk about targeting fishers and rangers, um, might be a little inaccurate because in fact, as Anna alluded, there are many different professions that are supposed to be applied under this pre-screening. Fisheries and public works are the two departments who are actually following with the policy, right? Your politicians up here decided to enact a policy and actually have procedures to follow it because LMG has always had a policy. We don't want any of our workers to show up to work under the influence of drugs or alcohol. They've always had that policy but it wasn't until last February that they actually implemented procedures to back it up. And one of those procedures included the pre-screening drug testing. So to me, I was listening on the live stream before I came over, and I know that there are a lot of you who are directly affected by some of the activities that's going on with the pre-screening drug testing, but as a community member listening who's actually in support of such uh, policy, it was getting a little frustrating hearing how there was a consensus that everything was being targeted, that fishers were being targeted, that rangers were being targeted. And because they're seasonal workers, it is really unfortunate that every time they get hired, yes, they have to go through this pre-screening, right? Because they technically get laid off, and then they technically have to get hired again. So that means any new hire has to be for the pre-screening drug test. So that is unfortunate, right? That, that is not like any other full-time profession. But I think the real question is, you know, I don't think that we should be punishing the fisheries or the public works department for actually following through with a policy that our politicians, policy and procedures that our politicians implemented. The real question is, more to Anna's point, why are the other departments not being tested? And it is chief and council's job and it is the senior director's job to make sure that those departments are following through with policies and procedures, but we should be directing our anger about that to those specific departments, right? So, capital infrastructure, why are you not testing your your carpenters. Uh, chipper, why are you not testing your employees? And senior director, why are we not aware that some of these things are happening? So it's not just about targeting our fishermen, choosing to target this specific group. I don't want to get mad at the public, at the natural resources department or the public works department for actually doing their job, for actually making sure that these testings are going through. And everybody gets a 30-day notice, right? And there is some gray area in the policy that we need to work on because clearly before the procedures were rolled out, there was no clear definition on what to do about medical marijuana. Because right now in Canada, medicinal use of marijuana is legal, so there should be some provisions. However, recreational use, <laughs> recreational use is not yet legal. It might be next year and maybe the policy will change, but right now recreational use is not yet legal. So that it does fall under one of those drugs that are identified in the drug testing. That's a legal thing in Canada. So there's definitely room for improvement. I think we can all agree on that. There's room for improvement. We need to figure out what we're gonna do about this medicinal marijuana. And we need to figure out what we're gonna do, what are the reprimands when departments don't follow through with this very important drug testing policy that is meant to protect our workers. So not just, and when we say taking advantage of, of, our, fisher, of our fisher people, it's not just thinking about that one person who may have been affected about by not failing a drug test. And believe me, not everybody who failed the drug test did it fail because they were on medicinal marijuana. It's about thinking about all the people on the boat who we have to make sure that they're safe and that they're working with people who are safe, right? So in principle, I believe in the policy. I believe that we need to create a safe working environment for all of our LMG employees, especially ones, those ones who are working in dangerous or safety hazard situations, all right? Heavy equipment operators, people working with power tools, people uh, needing to you know, do police work, our firefighting, our fishers, of course, our rangers, our forestry workers, all of that. I believe in that. I think that this policy still needs to grow and be tweaked a little bit to, to you know, make sure that we're covering all of our bases. But it was really upsetting to me listening at home, listening to about how we just feel that it's an intentional target on a, a certain group of people when really the fisheries department and the public works, they're, they're doing their job. They're actually following through the policy that your politicians put in place, you know? So I don't want to get mad at them. Of, of all the things we could possibly get mad at them for, I don't want it to be because they're actually doing a job that they were told to do. 
So that's just my thoughts. Can I, can I, can I add something to that? I, I'd like to add something to that, Don. Um, some of the comments that you're making did ring true with me. Um, we had that discussion yesterday when we were, t or two days ago, when we were talking about the need um, of, of a balance and that there needs to be more to just drug testing. There, there needs to be more to it. Um, I believe that there has to be a balance between safety, security, and the well-being in the workplace, but not only for alcohol and drugs, but also for violence and abuse in the workplace as well. There needs to be more work done to this policy and finding balance. But when you talk about medicinal use of marijuana, that it is legal in Canada right now, so by denying these people access to their medicine, it is a violation to their human rights and their charter of right to their medicine. So that's another thing that we also need to be aware of and that needs to be addressed in this policy. I don't, I don't know who has the mic, <laughs> yeah, we. and I don't know whose turn it is. Sorry, there's a lot of hands shooting up here. Right in the back. We have a question back here, just a moment. Hi, so it's Abby Metallic. I'm taking you off topic for a few minutes. I have to go. My kids are getting a little rowdy. Um, you obviously know I've been in contact with you guys for almost three months now about my complaint and issue, which I think is a concern and it should be dealt with. Uh, I've gotten many different things said from you guys, the OIC is not valid, it's vague, it's, I don't understand why you're not following it when it states that no non-native business is allowed to operate on the reserve. Um, you, why you haven't issued this letter yet, when it does say in the OIC that the, they need approval from you. So why isn't this letter sent to this person to stop operating her business here and if she requires approval from you let her ask the ask approval from you if you have nothing to have to say to her yet well then let her wait for those answers i guess or whatever um if you guys don't have any rules or regulations then come up with those but from now like as of now or even as since I last met with you guys, you guys should actually have to have sent her a letter to stop doing what she's doing. I don't know why you haven't did anything yet. Ab Abby, um, we, we have been working on the file. We, uh, we have followed up with you. There is a letter on its way to you. Uh, I got, the, I got okay. the email just this morning. Yes. Um, we are looking at... Um, you're right, there is an OIC that speaks to non-native businesses operating in our community. It addresses that, it says that uh, non-native businesses or, or non-native people operating businesses in our community need to get permission from chief and council, right? What isn't clear for us right now is what are the criteria through which we would say yes or no. That you was told never me you would say no. Everybody at that table except Lloyd, I haven't, ever heard from everybody agreed including yourself has agreed that no it would never even be allowed having if they, even if they asked you guys permission you would never allow it we I'm sorry I, I don't recall us making that statement I don't know you did because I asked you to your face and you told me to my face that you wouldn't continue to allow it you told Any... me to my face that you would actually send a letter to this person for her to stop operating her business. Okay, what I'm saying is that we need to develop those approval processes as well. Yes, well you we should still go by the OIC and have her stop running her business. Mm -hmm. if, she, if she wants to ask permission from you, let her. And that, until you have an answer for her, let her I wait under... until you guys come up with these rules and regulations. I, I understand If you do that. allow it. I understand that. We also I know feel that, that you guys are protecting these non-native people over me, who is a registered community business person here. I feel that you're not working fast enough to do this issue, but you're work very quickly to remove a non-native from the reserve, pull up an OIC from God knows when, fix that up and kick them off, but you won't stop a business. You can't do anything about people who've been previously running businesses and who are either registered or not. You can start by starting by preventing them from coming here and take using our land tax-free, 
you know, and talking bad of us uh, on top of that. Okay, so thank you. Um, I, I hear your concerns. I, I just want to share that we can't simply address one specific business. If we're to address this, we would need to address all businesses operating in a similar fashion. Yes. It's a, and that is a large undertaking, and it is not something that we can just send a letter out and, and address tomorrow. Well, when tomorrow. the complaint came to the table, it was only about one person. Now that I put it out there, you're going to have multiple ones. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And we need to make sure that it is taken in the proper steps are taken. You guys are just taking taken. your time, giving me different answers. There's legal consult. There's yes, lack there of weight behind this OIC where there's only lack of weight behind that table because you guys are not doing anything about it. No, we are. Why haven't you had anybody write this letter to have her stop? You know what, you want a rule and regulation? Well, why don't she start telling her to start paying us a tax? Put it towards the children, put it towards the youth center, we, something. We do not have any of those regulations in place. Going back to Fred's comments earlier, talking about a land code, those are things that could be developed, but we do not have them in existence yet, Abby. That's the unfortunate limitation to the OIC. Excuse me, <clears throat> I'm Abby's uncle, and for I can't, I still can't get what it is you're you're having a hard time understanding here. You're elected to protect us, to protect the land, to protect our culture, and you're sitting up there and saying, "Well, we don't have any procedures in place yet. We don't have any laws that that." you know, tell us what to do in, in, in cases like this. It's simple, you know, a non-resident, non-native is set up business on the reserve, using reserve land, using re and avoid paying taxes like, like most non-native businesses do throughout the country. But we have this person working on the reserve, taking advantage of our rights, and you're sitting there saying, Oh, we don't have a procedure in place. Maybe we can include that in the land use the policy that's being developed. You don't have to go that far. You have the authority. There are sections in the Indian Act that that's specifically refer to the use of the land exclusively and enjoyment for the native people. Use that. And if you're challenged, I don't think you will be challenged if you send that person a letter, a cease and desist instead of throwing it back and forth, back and forth. Take action. She's a businesswoman. She's struggling to make, to make a life for her and her children. And you guys are standing up there and saying, well, we haven't written the law yet. No, you don't kick the can down the road too often because there's a can coming up that's going to be kicked very soon if you don't act. I'm here to support her. And Understood. that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Yep. I understand. Again, I just want to say that um, what happened to the, the testing when they just tested the urine? And I'll tell you what happened because if you're smoking pot or doing drugs, especially marijuana, it's out of your system within four days. Okay, so everybody knows that. So you can easily pass the drug test. But, and I'm an addictions counselor, so I was trained in this field, so I did my homework. When you do a hair follicle test for something as simple as marijuana, it stays in your system for up to two years. So either way, you're fucked. Even if you, even if you don't smoke for a month, you're still going to fail. I'm sorry. So that has to be changed also. See, so you gotta look into that. And if you don't believe me, do your homework, look it up. A hair follicle test will never fail you. All, uh, drugs will stay in your system for up to two years, including marijuana. So I don't know, just wanted to bring that up.
Um, I have a co uh, comment from a community member it says, public works never did a drug test. Apparently there's one that even leaves his job site to go and sell drugs. She gave me a name, but I will not put the person's name out of respect for that individual. But um, also in regards to, um, I want to talk about this fishery committee meeting. Is Don still here? Oh, no. Um, you had a, you, the community has put out this fishery committee selection. I've been to every meeting. I gave my input, suggestions, and whatnot. And so when they got hired, I was not aware that individuals were hired. So I called up Kurt, the dam. I asked. Um, I didn't get a letter that I wasn't selected. I, I think out of professionalism, letters should be sent out like a job. When you don't get a job, a letter is sent out to you. So he sent the letter to me after the fact. But I did ask, how was this committee selected? And he, what he told me was each chief and counselor has selected individual. But when I addressed this to some of the counselors, that they said they got an email stating like, Joel, Frank, Sherry, Sam were selected and the ones that were at, the names that are there, some of them were not even at any of the, uh, the events. And on top of that, when I went through every freaking session from day one, it was to my understanding that an employee of the band or natural resources were not supposed to sit on this committee. It was to hire an elder, community members, and whatnot. Yet you have Fred Metallic and uh, Kurt Adam that sits on this committee, and they're bossing the committee members around because it's, it's coming out there. We had one person that quit because she found it like, it's like a zoo. The term was used like it's a zoo because no matter what the committee had brought to the table, it was shut down by Kurt and Fred because it wasn't to their standards or they just didn't want to work with it. And that's why our fishermen sit there because they're literally being screwed because you have a fishermen's committee that any board, if you know, no boards have people that work in that organization. A board member is a people that are from the outside, not people that work within and natural resources you have them two working there, the director, and I don't know what his title is. So I did call back because there was a space allocated. So I asked, but when I was told that, well, the chief is going to choose and the counselors will choose, I says, well, I don't, I have a fat chance and why should I apply? And that was that. Because I, I mean, just saying, like he did tell me that it was you guys that selected the people. And then I asked counselors, they said, no, the, the name was just submitted to them. So why have a Fisher's Committee if you're not actually involving the community, and it was a community, it was supposed to be a community input because I went to every session. Maybe I understood wrong. I wish she didn't yeah. leave that uh, she could have clarified that. So can you help me understand yeah. uh, why I'll, them two I'll, are there? I'll try my best, Sherry, to, to help you out. We were part of the selection, but we were not in the, the whole selection. Um, we, uh, we were talked to about the fisheries committee. The committee is not uh, an, an, an authority. It's an advisory committee to the director and the man fisheries manager. So that's why they're there. You're there to, to help them discuss issues and things like that, right? So that's why they're there. They're not, it, the, the committee is not an authority over the staff. It's there to help, help the staff, right? So that, that's the key there and why you would have Kurt sitting there because you're there to help him. Um, but as for the selection, yes, we were involved. We were not the whole part of the, the selection from what I understand. Uh, I think they came, uh, correct me if I'm wrong again, but Kevin and I just had a quick conversation. There was um, names that were brought up to chief and council and we uh, selected, you know, went through with elder, community member, council member. We gave our votes in and we don't know the results. We just know that the end result is who was on the committee. We've got one right here. How you doing? My name's uh, Peter Martin. Uh, I'm one of the captains here in Listogridge. Um, just, just to kind of set the record straight a little bit, uh, as far as the, the drug testing goes and uh, its procedures or however you guys say you're handling it. Uh, as the matter, uh, matter of the fact is, uh, there's three uh, unemployed captains right here. Uh, never had one blemish on our records in the whole entire of fishing between any one of the three of us and we've already all been replaced and uh, two of the guys sitting here have only had one test so you're 
you, you got in front of a camera last year before we went fishing when Adam Root was nice enough to video that there would be a procedure, one, two, three, and four uh, tests available. But uh, that was right out the window because uh, we've already all been replaced by non-natives, at least two of us anyway. And uh, I want to get to make a remark as far as the testing goes because there's a less evasive test that's been notified to Rose. Uh, about a swab test that doesn't have to be taken three months prior to your employment. And uh, uh, did you guys even uh, entertain that? Like there's a swab testing that will be for 24 hours and there's a swab test. Uh, there's police officers, they know all about this kind of stuff that you could take just before you go to go fishing. So if you're not sober one day, obviously you would get the test the second day, like you guys are saying or whatever, the second test. but it never even got to a second test for these guys. They got replaced. Can, I couldn't sit here today and, and leave today without saying something. Can, can I speak, speak to that? If, if you don't mind, Peter. Um, I was met with Fred today just for that point of clarification because I was hearing the same thing, right? He expressed to me that the importance here is to get you guys back into your captain role as soon as possible. If you are, if, and this is what he told me, right? So um, if you haven't taken a second test yet, it's up to you whenever you want to take that second test. And the, and the day you get that positive results, you're back on the boat. The guys that's, have been replaced. The fact of the today. matter, Darcy, Chief Darcy, is they've been replaced. All, they've already been replaced. There was no second uh, test. Un, for myself personally, there wasn't even a result from my second test. And until I had been you replaced. Pass. As soon as, you, as soon as you got a clean test, you're back. If you miss the beginning of the fishing season, you're done. No, The, the, the no. majority of the crab caught, no. I'm a captain. I got other captains fishing no. here two decades. You miss the first four weeks of fishing, you might as well stay home. Okay. Well, That's the fact of the matter. That's what you guys keep forgetting. To, hey, uh, I'm all for drug testing. Yeah. These guys are for drug testing. Mm -hmm. we, we're, we're here for safety. Not one of us will be using or had ever used while we were in care of uh, our crew. We're responsible for mm -hmm. our crew when we get out there. Legally, I don't need anyone on your panel to tell me my job or what, what's at stake. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I you appreciate guys, that, I really you do. You guys, a long time ago, when this whole agreement came up about fishing, because I was fishing with Donald Marshall, we were fishing. Guys were begging us to support chief and council. You guys won't have to fight no more. You'll be, getting, be able to go home and get a job from your community. And just since then, it just got withered down and withered down. It took me 14 years with a cabin stick to get a job from you guys. I, there's no end to the bullshit. For, for, you know, excuse my French. And now with the drug testing, I know for a fact there's an OIC that was handed to HR that stated 15 different groups right off the get for the drug testing. And I know how you guys watered it all down to just us two and you guys keep talking about it and talking about it. But fair is fair. Yes. You're supposed to lead by example. Yes. This should have started with you guys and all the directors. Don't, don't start at the bottom. Don't start at the bottom and start pointing your fingers at people. Mm -hmm. Fact of the matter is, you had three captains last year from this community. They're all sitting right here right now jobless because of this policy. But some of the nicest guys I know right here. Not a thing wrong with them and they're sitting here. We're not fishing, we're not working, we're unemployed. Bottom line, over marijuana and stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. there, there, there's less evasive tests. You can test people just before they get on the boat. You guys have shore managers. You guys have people in place for this. Don't come and tell the community, oh, this is terrible, that everything's terrible. I fish with other guys that sit in there with their prescription of perks in their pocket and they're accepted. You got guys that don't want to get back on opiates and sometime or other they stepped up and said, you know, I don't want pills. I got a little problem, I'll deal with it my own way. But F the pills. Now they're getting crucified for it. But if they go back to pills, it'll be all right. And nobody's talking about that. Get rid of the drugs, get rid of the drugs. Well, it's starting right here. People are trying to go from one thing. Hey, weed is natural, it grows from the ground. Nobody has to F and make it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what we choose to do. We got a prescription for it. Most of the guys have prescriptions for medical marijuana. It's sitting right here. But the guys with the pills, they can get on the boat. 
Make sure everybody here knows that. I'm sitting here, I got nine children, no effing job. Thanks a lot. Um, before, I, I just want to say um, thank you everybody for your comments on this topic. It is, is something that obviously there's a lot of passion and heartfelt and it's not falling on deaf ears at all. As Sheila mentioned, we did talk about this two nights ago at council. We st started looking at and talking about how do we do a better job with this or how can we change or improve this policy? How can we strengthen it up? You, uh, Peter, I think you're exactly right that you know, maybe there is testing before you get on the boats, but there's got to be something that's, that's done at the boat as well. Uh, we know that, that that's where safety is key and important. We, we hear that. Uh, it's unfortunate Dawn's not here. I think she brought an interesting perspective, being able to talk about how this policy was implemented. Anna, um, just again to state, in that letter, yes, you did state, or I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you wrote it. I don't know who wrote it. There was no signature on it. Uh, but as you stated, there are examples that were highlighted in there. I know that the HR department did follow up on those uh, mentioned uh, incidences, but I'm not, I can't give you an update as to what happened or what came of those situations, whether, there is, uh, whether they're founded or not. I can't update you on that. That's something we can follow up on. Going back to Don's point as well, if this is not being implemented across the board in a fair way, there's never been any intention to target any group, any individuals, anything like that. It is something that we have to look at how do we make sure everything is fair. If there is unfairness, then we need to fix that. We need to do something different and more clear. I see Dolly has the mic up here. Um, uh, earlier, Darcy, you had stated that um you, they were questioning uh, the doctor's decision, uh, may not, maybe not questioning, but they were looking at uh, the doctor saying that uh, this individual, uh, Nicole, had a sore shoulder. Is she mm -hmm. capable of working, uh, going back on the boat? However, um, as you know, if anybody has gone to the, uh, the doctor uh, and had a specific uh, diagnosis of maybe uh, something wrong with the back shoulder or whatever, uh, but they're able to go back to work. They're able to perform their duties uh, with some type of medication. These people are still allowed to work. So if somebody is being, uh, if they were given a, a prescription by a doctor, that wouldn't be questioned. Now this is miracle marijuana. So like Peter had stated, we have three captains here today that were uh, that are out of a job and they're, they've been replaced. Um, I do believe all three have a medical marijuana card. Um, and they have specified that there's testing out there that could be done just before you get on the boat. Now, is that something that Chief and Council would be committed to, to get these three men back on their boats, as you stated, that as fast as possible, get a hold of those tests, take a swab, put them back on their boats, if not tomorrow, by Monday. Well, Dolly, that, Dolly, that was exactly the point of the conversation today with Fred. How quickly can I, we get our captains that need to be on the boat back on the boat, right? And he said as soon as there is a clean test, they're well, back. Well, can they get that swab? Uh, that I can't answer you. I, I'm not sure of the accuracy of the swab. I'm not, that's not my field of expertise at all. Well, um, that's, no, no, let, I, let's, I'm, do, I'm let's do something for them. No, that's, that's not the case. That's not the case. That's the... Right. Right. Okay, so the, the update that I got, the update that I got today is that it can process through the body. Uh, somewhere in the range of four weeks is usually what it takes uh, to be able to get through the testing. That okay, can vary so is there individual. is there a plan? Is there a plan in place that they don't le they don't lose a quarter of the season, or they don't lose two weeks of a season, or from, three weeks? Yes, from you what know, I understand, get it done ASAP. Yes, These are that, livelihoods. and and that is is I think up to the individual captains. The sooner they get tested, and the sooner they pass a test. So do they have to go for another swab of their head? They have to be scalped again? Uh, that's a detail that I'm not aware of. 
to me, that would be something that would be talked about with, with Fred or HR or the nurses and how that would go about. But the goal is here, and it's always to get our people working. I mean, that's, that's... I'm, I'm, I'm not... I think that's why there's a medical con con consult on that summer, to find out what the prescription is for. Again, I'm, I'm not the medical expert, but that's why it's being sought, for that clarity, to try to get our captains back on the boats to get them working. The replacement is, is, is temporary. So if it's one week, it's one week. If they're ready sooner, then, then, then they're there, they're, they're gone. But, but I, 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 I don't know those situations. I, I'm not sure. Anyway, that, but that, that's, that's where we're at. Dolly, to answer your question, as quick as possible. As quick as possible, that's always the goal. Always. We have one more question back here. Yes, I've got to get home to my own children, so I just wanted to add, we can speak in circles all day long um, about whether or not it's targeted or it's unintentional. The reality is, and I can name off, at least five to ten people in public works, uh, sorry, in carpentry, and at least one person that was laid off for the winter and returned to public works recently that was not subjected to pre-employment drug testing. So we can talk in circles all day and try to make the people at home believe that this is not targeted, whether it's intentional or not. But the reality is, is this policy is being applied selectively and it's putting Mi'kmaqs out of work as a result. That's the reality. That being said, you guys can say, you claim all this, what are you going to do to get these guys back to work? And I will add that I have a lot more HR experience than probably most of you. And back in December, at the very first fisheries committee meeting, as a potential solution to the unfairness of the policy from last season and the issue with people watering down their urinalysis, because we all know in HR circles, social services in many provinces across Canada no longer accept hair follicle testing because of the margin for false positives. They also no longer accept urinalysis because it's too easy to cheat it with drinks and fasts and everything else. They use blood tests and they use cheek swabs. Because when you drug test someone, it's not to make your life more convenient. It's not to um, screen out people that you might think are, are a risk to the workforce. It's to gauge intoxication on the job while performing one's duties. And that is why, quite often, it's a swab. And I su suggested this as a solution to the fisheries committee in December, an eight hour test or a 24 hour test. So I just wanna clarify to everyone listening, you can try to talk in circles all you want, but the reality is, is that we have Mi'kmaq captains out of work right now, after 20 years of service, that we're told to hand their keys over. We have crews right now that are struggling to say, what do we do? Do we protest to support our captains, knowing that the department laughs and says, we'll just sell all the quota? I got an invitation to Burnt Church just yesterday to go tour a fish plant because they want to buy 300,000 pounds of crab before our guys and our men and women even have a chance to get out there and try to earn it. There's big problems, and you guys can talk in circles all you want and try to bury your heads in the sand, but we voted for you. We did not vote for the directors. We did not vote for the managers. We voted for you to guide our community and make decisions. I voted for most of you up here, and I'm very disappointed. This chain of command that you've adopted, it doesn't work, and it's not the Mi'kmaq way. It needs to change.
turn it on? I have another email. Um, can you find out when it became legal for our licenses or quota to be fished without our listigawaji aboard? Can you answer that? Anybody from the table? As far as I know, the, uh, the practice has always been that at least one of our fishermen need to be on the boat. I don't know whether that's a, a legal obligation or something that we imposed as just the way we do it. Maybe there's uh, more, more experienced politicians that, uh, that have uh, pushed for that and made sure that that was enforced. But I know that that's a practice that we've always... Because uh, they also mentioned that last year we had a white captain take our boat out, lie to one native about the ha hail, I'm not sure what hail, hail hail out time and ended up going out for a week long trip without one of our people aboard okay. and this happened about three times okay so that was that brought up to our fisheries department which one would be aware of it are you guy are you fishermen aware of this situation somebody going out okay to out. anybody uh -huh. okay Three up. okay so our fisheries okay. department our is aware boat. Our boat? Our boat? Yeah. Uh, uh, kids. Our fisheries department is aware? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. No, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. They can't go on without our fishermen. No. Yeah. Okay. Our, okay. Okay. Mm. okay. So, um... <laughs> We do have an agenda that I'd like to get a couple more things uh, discussed and moved on. Uh, they, they are kind of important and pressing, not to cut off the discussion, but I think we've, uh, we, we've, we've had a good discussion and gotten a lot of good input and recommendations, asked a lot of questions. Um, next up would be uh, paving and school projects. So I got a call from uh, Sky Metallic earlier this afternoon. He's, uh, he was at INAC uh, talking about uh, a paving plan for Listigooch. Uh, we got approval today to pave most of the roads in Listigooch. Uh, very soon there will... Yes, Church Crescent is one of them. Uh, so it, it, it's good news. It's good news. Yeah. You, you can go now, eh? Um, so yes, there, there is a paving plan to pave as many of the roads as possible. There uh, will be more details coming out, but Sky wanted to share that right away with you. Uh, yeah, uh, the only one that I can say is, is excluded for now is uh, Capelin Road between Interprovincial and uh, Nation Lane. Okay, and because... Uh, Interprovincial. Interprovincial, so going towards uh, Mom's Duty Free. And the reason why is because we have to work and we are working with MTQ to resolve the issues at that corner the drainage issues so we had we also got a call from MTQ this afternoon looking to figure out how we can resolve that issue so I know that's a long-standing issue we know that paving is something I drove around the community yesterday that it needs to be done so uh, hopefully this this is it we'll get it done and we know that there's a few land ownership issues that we're gonna have to work around and make sure we get the right of ways that we need, but uh, more details will come, and Wendell said he wanted to share a little bit about the Capelin Road. Why? Uh, first of all, I want to congrats to, uh, congratulate the team that's in uh, Quebec City right now uh, concerning our uh, capital and infrastructure projects that are going on, and that is the, uh, one of them is the school project uh, and the cafeteria. Why Capelin Road was excluded, uh, Capelin Road is a separate project. It's been going, uh, the fight has been going on for 10 years with MTQ, Point de la Croix. Even that time we ran for uh, mayor and uh, still wasn't resolved for, it's, it was an issue by MTQ at that time, not to allow us to hook up to uh, Interprovincial Highway on the other side of uh, Capelin Road. But uh, prints have been, uh, have been approved. Uh, discussions have been made uh, in, that'll be one of uh, separate projects. 
But the, uh, the problem we're going to have in Paven is just a couple of streets, small streets. It's a, the right of ways. We will have to ask the, uh, I think it's only on the Dam Street, uh, the right of way. There's part of it is on band land and uh, just a piece of it. It's owned by somebody anyway, but those are minor things that can uh, happen, but all the streets will be paved except for Capeland Road this year because it'll be a major project. That's a separate project because there's a big problem at the Bolio Turn. The Bolio Turn is full of water which backs up to Terry Isaac's property, you know where Terry Isaac lived, Sherman and all them. Even Vera Lee's house at that time had to be lifted and they're still having the same problem. That will alleviate the problem uh, by next year. The project is going to start this spring, but it's not going to be paved, hopefully, this spring, summer. But it won't, I don't think it'll be paved this year, but the, the remainder streets, like uh, they were discussing, even Old Mill Road will be paved after uh, so many years. But that's a project, uh, that's uh, a longer project. Capeland Road will take about uh, year and a half to two years, but they started this spring. That's, that's the uh, best they can do right now. And like I say, it's a major artery to the reserve, ambulances, fire trucks, and whatnot coming in from Cross Point. So uh, negotiations went well with MTQ and with Point Delacroix, they are all in agreement that we all, there's no way we can do that project unless we all work together, and that's what we did. And after 10 years, that project will be a reality. And rest of the roads in Lissa was being paved. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. All Tiplin Road has to be redone. There, there's no, uh, there's no uh, doubt about it because that was the biggest project. They also, they also have to put a pumping station right near the graveyard to pump the water. That's how much water there is over there. That's how bad it is over there. So that's what they're going to do over there too. A pumping station, which is, I don't know. It's a big project. That's why we said that all the roads will be paved, excluding Capelin Road for this year. Yeah. There is uh there is there is drinks there. Ethical? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I'm not an engineer, but there's one in front of Karis and uh one in front of um Joni's. There's a drainage there. So when she flooded over there, I pumped the water from her driveway to that storm drain. Cause she would have had uh right to her step. And see, uh, yes, sir. What's the cost for all these paved that's going to be happening? What's going to be the cost right now? The estimate is about three million dollars. Wow, no, just uh, small streets, it's yeah, just for the just for the uh, small streets. Okay, uh, it, what's the, going to be the cost if you guys uh, invest in a paving plant or some kind of portable paving plant? That's a good question. That's a really good question. As, uh, I asked Wendell that about uh, 10 years ago when he was campaigning with the Marshall Monies. And you should have done that 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. With the Marshall dollars 10 years ago, look what you have today. Look around. There's people working. We have boats. We have people working. <laughs> and now we're getting uh, our roads paid by, uh, by the uh, department. Because we can't pay them all at once, our capital budget only allows us for uh, mostly maintenance. 1.3 million dollars a year goes all, that's re, uh, repairing roads, things like this. It's hard to, uh, hard to uh, uh, spend money on new pave and everything. So there was a solution. Solution has been made to okay. pave all the streets. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to use Marshall dollars, uh, Dennis. You don't got them. <laughs> anyway, we uh, have them. <laughs> we don't need to use them. Listen, uh, how much does it cost every year to patch all these roads? Every year? That's something I would have to ask uh, Jody. It was about $250,000 a year. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and how many years have been patching these roads? Add that up. Yeah. 
That's why we're getting new roads now. <laughs> okay. So, point taken. Should have invested in paving a long time ago. Okay. Um, okay. Just hang on for the mic so everybody can hear. That's the, the key. How many uh, native people are going to be working on these roads? Because on the last roads that were being that were worked on, on average there was about four or five people working from this reserve. The rest were off from, from non-reserve or even non-native people working. Mm. Uh, I've witnessed when they were doing the main road, Riverside East and Riverside West, there was approximately 15 people that were non-native working, and there was only two people working from this reserve. Like, how many are they going to be working this time? Okay. That's, uh, that's a good question and something that should be taken up with uh, as the, the, the bidding process is taken going through and make sure that we maximize uh, our, our workforce if it's not our own capital department that does the work. So I, I, I hear you. We need to maximize and make sure it is... Yes. The, the same thing with the expansion of the school. Yes. How many people are going to be working there? That's my next point. So the, the, the school is not confirmed yet. Uh, but we had a good meeting uh, yesterday. Lorna was there attending. She, she updated to say that uh, everything looks like it's moving forward as well. We're going to have INAC here on, uh, in May. I think it's May 21st to have a look at the school project. Uh, if it goes through, what it would include is a cafeteria, extending the gym, having a uh, stage area, um, and a, a wing dedicated to the Mi'kmaq immersion. So. It would be a significant uh, expansion. Again, uh, the importance here is making sure that it is our own people that do the work. That, that has to be the, the emphasis going forward, right? So whatever uh, contractors bid, what, uh, if we have our own that can do it, let's do that. Like, that's for the school, but what about for the roads? Same thing, right? Same emphasis. Rodney? Uh, most of the roads now are being paved. The work is done. Our capital group is more than capable of doing all drainage. The only thing left to do on uh, Glido or one of those long streets adjacent to uh, Pacific Drive is drainage, which we do our own, our own drains. It'll be done by our capital roads people. But Ah. Good point, good point. Medic? <laughs> she said, don't know the same people that did the lines. Oh, did the lines, yeah, at least we get it. No, but mostly it's minor work left that has to be done, Rodney, on this project. Yeah. And it'll be done by all our capital. It's only drainage in some streets that has to be done. Just, just a few things. So uh, next, moving on to the next one, uh, talking about the policing agreement. As you know, the, uh, or, or, Hopefully you know or may not know, but uh, the First Nations policing program uh, came to an end uh, or was coming to an end uh, this, this fiscal year. Uh, that was a national thing, not just in Listigoch, but across Canada. Um, Public Safety Canada committed to renewing that program. They still have not made it an essential service as it should be. However, there is a lot of work being done at the national level and at the regional level to make sure that policing services in First Nation communities becomes an essential service. So that's not something that's being lost. Um, locally here, we were able to, uh, to benefit, um, I would say, Lloyd, uh, although not a local portfolio holder, we don't have portfolios during this administration, he was a portfolio holder at the regional level at the AFNQL. And that allowed us to uh, coordinate and collaborate with a lot of the other First Nation communities uh, and find out how the negotiations were going in other communities. And with that, we were able to secure a, a, a little over a 22% increase from last year's funding, um, which, which equals about uh, almost $300,000 extra for our police this year, uh, which means that we can start paying uh, paying them a little bit more in, in what they deserve and be comparable, uh, comparable to other policing rates. We can send more uh, cadets to training. We've sent three to training in the last two years. Uh, I believe next year. next year we can send another two more and then we'll be able to hire them as well because we'll have some money. Uh, we can make more investments into uh, equipment, 
upgrading uh, the, the standards that they're, they're working in and improving the working conditions. Um, I don't know if you... Yes, uh, the other thing is this is a one-year increase for now. Uh, we also secured a commitment from both uh, Quebec and Canada to keep working to uh, a long-term agreement and hopefully with that better funding going forward. So that's what we're able to do this year. So our, our police force uh, does continue. They do get stronger. They continue to rebuild. And we'll see more of our people uh, filling those roles uh, as two of them complete training. Uh, July Trapper, around then? Around July. So you'll see a couple of new recruits, a couple of our own coming back and working here. So we look forward to that. Did I miss anything on that? Uh, no? OK. It takes about five every January. Yeah. Um, yes, one of the questions we had is the criteria on, uh, we, we don't set the criteria for making through, so there will be another recruitment call um, in, for um, new officers or people that are interested to become officers. We don't set the recruitment or we don't set the criteria that you have to, to pass. That's set by the Atlantic Police Academy or the Atlantic Police College. Is it academy or college? Academy. So the Atlantic Police Academy sets the criteria. So you have to pass their criteria to get in. Uh, that's where uh, I think we started with about 19 that expressed interest last time. We ended up with two. It isn't, uh, nobody's going to give it to you. You've got to work for it. You've got to go out and get it and make sure you pass all the tests. So again, there will be a recruitment drive starting soon. The program, the training starts every January. So even though it is in January, we should be getting the word out soon that we need more officers to go to training. Okay. Uh, the last uh, in sort of the ongoing files is we know that uh, going forward there are going to be some discussions with forestry. We know we have some people that work in that industry. Uh, right now uh, we have some scheduled talks to see how we can increase the allocation that we have in forestry. So increase it from last year, secure what we had last year and then keep building on that. Just to give you an update, so nothing uh, confirmed other than at the worst 40,000 uh, cubic meters, which is what it was last year, and then we're hoping for more, and, and we'll work for more. And uh, we're also looking at budworm re remediation and being part of that. So I know that was a concern that was brought up. A um, few other things, just general office updates it says on here. Um, we have an annual report that's been prepared. Uh, that should be out soon. It's just going through its last, uh, last edits and double checks for spelling and, and corrections. Um, a question that I've been asked to ask you is, do you want hard copies? Uh, we can have them available for download. Do you want them in the, uh, should we put one in everybody's mailbox? Yes? Okay, we can do that and we'll make them available for download. Uh, some job postings that have gone out. I'll uh, make sure we, know, we make, uh, make that aware. We have uh, beautification laborer, beautification supervisor, Gig new educator. We have a director of finance uh, position that should be posted on Monday. Listigoch Powwow groundskeeper. Uh, Loose Cup First Nation has posted a couple of positions. There's the assistant to their chief and a bookkeeper. Uh, Zenibus is looking for a compliance supervisor, looking for adult education, French second language teacher. Uh, and a couple of summer students' positions through so the Indigenous Student uh, Summer Employment Program from the Government of Canada and Aboriginal Student Employment Program, Canada Revenue Agency. So that's it for, that's what I have on my notes. Uh, it says after that question and answer period, but uh, we've certainly asked a, a lot of questions throughout. I don't want to cut anybody off or uh, uh, deny anybody from asking any questions. Lloyd has something he wants to say before we go to any, any further questions. It was just, um, it was just a quick uh, statement. You might have seen me get up a few times on my phone. It was no disrespect to the meeting. Um, my son had to go to the hospital, and my wife's here now, so I just wanted to say that I was just getting updates on his health. That's all it was. It wasn't me texting, leaving. I just wanted to let the people know that it was a health issue. So. Um, I have a question regarding your job descriptions I think they're a little bit way out there because um, your criteria is tough like okay. I see some of them and a lot of our community members don't have that and a lot of them are discouraged because of the way it's written in the the job descriptions and my concern is that um, during the interview process 
the names are so, like the people that apply, it goes to, to directors. I believe that a director should not say, well, okay, let's take Kathy, Sheila, Darcy, but we won't take Wendell because so-and-so don't like Wendell. And I've asked that question before that it, uh, it did happen and it does happen where, you, where the director of that, that, you know, say in education, a director in the health, that's where you're determining how people get processed through the interview process. I think my suggestion is um, everybody should have an interview, no matter what, is because they took the time and the encouragement to submit a, their you know, resumes and what abilities they have. But I think you should look beyond that too because, and then when I asked about social workers, they have no education, but now they're taking their BSWs and then they're on the grandfather system. Is it just for them that has this grandfather system or? It, because if you're going with all these criteria for all these positions, it's not fair to community members because you had people, you have people on staff in your organizations that don't even have an educational background. They just got in there because their father, grandfather, when they were 18, got a job and they're still there 30, 40 years later. I mean, I don't think that's fair to our community members because a lot of the people here do go out and get educated, but they still miss a little piece of the criteria. That's just something I'm, a suggestion. Good. Thank you. I have a uh, question, Darcy. Yes. How come when we work for beautification, uh, we were treated as slaves, all of us pretty much? There was a few selected by the supervisors. We went to the chief and council. Our last day of work it was November 3rd. We all went to our whole crew that same day, went there. And we tried to get answers from you. I talked to uh, Wendell, I talked to uh, Sky Metallic, and I talked to you. And we never were, none of us was able to go in and speak up at the meeting at the band office on Tuesday. Our last day was Friday, we were all suspended, our whole crew. said that we got our uh, papers uh, November uh, 2nd, when we only got them November 3rd. And you said you'll see us, we went to the band office, we weren't even able to go up to the meeting. None of us, our whole crew went there. Just listen. Okay. Um. Yes, I, I, I'm aware of the situation that you brought forward. Uh, we followed up with HR and, and... How come individuals, each one of us, wasn't able to go up and speak? At council? Yes. Uh, we supported the HR process that was in place. So it was only one girl was allowed to make a complaint against all our crew and none of us was able to defend ourselves? Uh, that those complaints were accepted by HR, they were reviewed. Our elders, and after surgery, we put them on a bus to come home from Montreal to here in Listogosh. That's sad. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's just, you know, something to think about uh, when policies are being created. Uh, I know it can't, all policies can't be created overnight and let's take all our elders now and create policies and change all of what's going on, but that's what we need. We need our elders to guide us. As we guide our children, we need our elders to guide us. That's my thought for tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Dolly. One of the things that I, and I just wanna follow up on what you're saying, Dolly, not to, to cut you off or delay. Um, that's the part I like the most about these meetings is getting to that conversation, right? Because like you, like you said, it, it is about learning, it is about that dialogue back and forth. Uh, we often get these, conver uh, the, these questions is this a consultation? Is this a con no? It's not a con. It's a chance for us to talk. It's a chance for us to reconnect, you know. And and to me, that's the important part of these meetings, these discussions. 
I'm not going to call them a, a consultation. I, to me, it's it, let, let's talk. It's a chance to say, this is what's happening. What are your concerns? And I think that's the way we've approached it the whole time. We've given everybody a chance to talk. I think you were here at one that was really maybe uh, maybe about 20 people, and I think we sat like in a, almost in a huddle and had some really good conversations. So Paula, yeah, you're, you're right. I don't know if she left, but that's what we need to have, more discussions like that. Um, and it's a bit of a plug here, but that's what's going to happen in housing, right? How do we get to that level on more things more often? You're, you're bang on, and yes, uh, the importance of elders, getting that, that input. Yep. Yes, yep. And it's 160 bucks. Like, what did I buy? And a lot of times there's somebody in front of me at a grocery store and they have to put things back. And I'll, if I have to cash on me, I'll, I'll, you know, it's not often that I do, but you know, when I do, I will give it because it's, it's a struggle each and every day for our people. And like I said earlier, we can't, not everybody can work, you know, in, in the community all year round. Um, you know, and, and we, we've talked about forestry. You know, we need our chief and council to um, to fight for forestry as well, mm -hmm. to help them because they employ a lot of people. You know, last year, um, yeah, I have I have a timber jack, and um, I guess I was a little too late to ask for a lot, so I was denied. I took it at face value for a day or two, and then I said, whoa, no, that's my right to be up there. Mm -hmm. I have equipment, and it's my right, so I want a lot. I couldn't use it right away. It, was, it broke down, and it's expensive to fix. It's not you know, four or $500. You're talking about thousands when your machine breaks down. But I was denied a lot. And I went back, and I told Martha and Fred, no, it's my right to be up there. And I got a lot. Mm -hmm. Mind you, it was at the end of the season, I only got one lot, but still I got a lot. So, and, and that goes to each and every one of us here. So it's just not, you're not walking down with your head up high on welfare day. You know, it's, it's, it's not a proud moment. It's, am I gonna pay my bills? Am I gonna get grocery? What am I gonna do? So helping one another and, and, and um, rather than beating each other down and, and, and this point system is the first time I ever hear of it, but everybody deserves to work. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you have 10 points or two points, you're a human being as well. And like I said, in, at the beginning of, of our meetings, yes, we do get frustrated and the tensions are high. And see how calm we are now? Look. We got it all out. We're calm. We're okay. No. Respectfully. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Yes, you can. Uh, I haven't been here long. I heard stuff on the radio and what I've heard here and what I'm hearing is that uh, in um, the government trying to make things um, more structured, safer, more fair, um, it's actually done the complete opposite and caused a little bit of chaos, um, hurt some people, and... Uh, and a lot of unfairness that is being felt. So maybe it's time to take a step back and see what's not working, what worked, mm -hmm. what didn't work this time around, and make some adjustments because uh, I know you, none of you have any ill intention to hurt anybody in the community, but um, something is not working and, and, and it's happening. So mm -hmm. how can you fix it? Yep. Thank you, Cheryl. That's where our elders come in. Yep. Uh, Thanks. Uh, yes. I wanted to uh, <clears throat> say a few last words uh, regarding regarding the uh, the fishermen that were here tonight, and in particular the uh, uh, the drug testing policy that prevents them from, you know, captaining their boats putting people to work. It's obvious that the, uh, 
drug testing policy wasn't very well planned. It certainly wasn't uh, implemented properly. And the rollout of this plan certainly, you know, didn't go well. A lot of people have been hurt by it because, and I don't put the blame on you guys. You have administrators who work on this, who do research on, on drug testing policy and HR uh, issues, but it's not working. It's hurting a lot of people. And for me to look and see three captains sitting here at this the table next to me tonight, asking you, you know, to take a look at what you've done and change it so that they can go back to their boats and make money for every one of us. They don't make it just for themselves. They make it for everyone in this room, everyone in this community. They work hard, especially the captains. It took them a long time to get to the position of captain, which is captain of the boat, the boss. He's the, he's, what he says goes. They take on a lot of responsibility. And at the same time, work hard, along with their uh, co-workers, deckhands. So I don't know about you, but to me, if I were you, I'd huddle, huddle uh, later tonight amongst the rest of your colleagues, or maybe tomorrow morning, and put some kind of a, uh, a suspension to the testing, rework your plan, rework the, the program, so that it's fair and it doesn't target certain populations, certain groups of workers, put a, put, a, put a hold on it and let these men go back to work while you guys fix the problem that was created. They didn't create it, it was created at your level, handed down to the managers, and then they have to suffer. They don't need to suffer, it's not their fault. They want to go to work, they've been trained, they have licenses to operate these boats. They take the lives of everybody on their boat in their hands every time they go out. That's a lot of responsibility. And to have them sit here tonight at a community meeting wondering what's going to happen to them, it's just not right. Take the lead. Show your leadership. Suspend the testing. Let these boys go back to work, girls, whatever. Rework your testing plan, bring it to the community to see if they, if they want it that way, then everything will be fine. But if you do something without the community's input, it's, do, it's doomed to fail. Just as you've seen tonight with the fishermen. Now I, I support these fishermen. I support them because they work hard. They don't just go to work and loaf around. They're out in the ocean. And they got to come back with a full, full boat of fish. And every one of that fish costs money for them to get, but it brings money into you as well, to every one of us here. Last year, they say they brought in $18 million. And you want to reward them by throwing them, throwing them off to the side for a simple pot test? In July, pot's going to be legal. You could smoke it anywhere, except for government buildings. Cut them some slack. Put them back to work. That's what they want, and that's what they deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a question from online, just, before, just one second. And Madeline as well. Um, this one's for you, Kathy. Um, it has been my understanding via your posts on social media that currently your cause is to assist the fishermen during the process for drug testing. You have announced that you are running for chief as you, uh, and as such your role is to represent the community as a whole. As Don pointed out earlier, employees within natural resources and fisheries have been blamed, targeted and subject to lateral violence for following policy. My question is what, uh, is, what is your opinion on the treatment and what measures uh, have you been taking to eliminate the ongoing behavior occurring daily to those community members? They too have families and, uh, to go home to, they too have the right to fair treatment, and they too have the right to dignity. Which, uh, fair I believe the question is, um, what is your opinion on the treatment and, uh, that the natural resources staff has been receiving in regards to lateral violence 
and uh, being targeted and blamed? And uh, what measures have you, have you been taking to eliminate the ongoing behavior? Okay, um, I did meet with Dr. Fred a couple weeks ago and I discussed the um, issue that the Fishers had. I discussed quite a few of the issues that the Fishers had. And in that meeting uh, with Dr. Fred, we acknowledged that there was lack of communication and that, the, yes, we did mention that our employees are our people too. And that there's a lot of miscommunications happening uh, the Fishers themselves have mentioned, uh, Holly's here, or she was here, oh yeah, she's there, that there needs to be some sort of mediation and some sort of resolve between the administration staff of the natural resources and the Fishers themselves. There's a lot of tensions there, there's a lot of hurt feelings there, and yes, I did discuss this with Dr. Fred. So that was the beginning of um, some type of solution to be sought, because in the end, we're all, we're all listigush. The fishers, the administrators, all of us, we're all, we're all here. We're all from the same community. And when things like this happen, it has to be repaired. So yes, I did take some measures to rectify that. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Madeline. And I've been living here in uh, Listigorch for I was born and raised here, actually, but I went away for a while. And uh, this meeting is very interesting and was very informative, but I'm also very disappointed and very hurt on behalf of our community members. Uh, it's interesting that we did, never had these meetings before more often, and you wouldn't see so much anger and uh, uh, debriefing into to you guys or to anybody that's targeted over here. If we had these get-togethers more often, you wouldn't see this, what you saw this evening. We'd be able to talk more. We'd be able to uh, communicate more freely and not targeting each group or whatever uh, people are feeling. So I think uh, having more meetings and having people express their concerns would be a lot easier for the chief and council to be able to answer questions more uh, in a calmer way. I support the fishermen. I support the fishermen since 1980, 1981, of what happened to our community. My brother was involved in that. And today I stand very proudly to say that my brother was involved in the fishery in the first place. And I think if it wasn't for them bleeding not guilty, we wouldn't be so far ahead with the fisheries, you know? And I believe that Buxy and my brother Donnie brought this on to our community. And I'm very proud of the both of them. They're not here today to speak for the community or the fishermen, but I am here as Madeline Germain. He's my brother. And I am going to speak for him each time the fishermen have a problem. And I, every time they have anything, issues that they are facing, I will support them. And if they're going to go and do a protest, wherever they're supposed to be going, I'm going to be there. Because I think there is one planned, a protest. If these non-native people, the captains, run their ships. We're going to go and protest. And I want to be there. And I want to represent my brother, because he's not here today. But I am. I am here. Yeah. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. 
I'm a Mi'kmaq woman. I'm 70 years old. But I don't feel that I am 70, even though I was ill for a while. Thank God and thank for everybody that supported me through all the things that I went through and my husband and my sister. It's not easy going through all these things. And the same thing in the community here. I'm not the only one that has that problem, illness, disease. There's other members here in the community that have that. And yes, we need to listen to our elders. And there's not that many in here today. You know why? Because they don't trust anymore. They don't trust anymore because they've been lied to. They've been promised. They've gone through so many things. That's why you don't see them here. But I'm here. And I wish, I wish sometimes you need to think about these things. It's not science, uh, science uh, you know. You don't need to be a scientist to be uh, having common sense, you know. It's not science fiction here. It's either yes or no, right or wrong, fairness or not. We need to listen to the people. How many times have I seen you in this bingo hall since you guys have been elected? Twice. Two years you're here in the community, and I've only seen two meetings like this since, unless if I'm missing, missing something here, correct me if I'm wrong. We're not allowed to go to the counseling chambers because we want to express our concerns. We're not allowed there. You have to be on the agenda. I have so many concerns, and I, I don't have time to be going on the agenda. I'd like to be heard, just like this evening. You know, there's nothing bad about this. Listening to me is not, is not over your head. You just need to listen and hear the people. I love my people, and I love my community, and I'm very, very disappointed. I go to meetings other than this one, and that's all we ever talk about, people. How are we going to help our people? And we've been doing a great job. We've been doing a great job, and we're not even counselors. I hope the next elect, elected officers or elected counselors are more compassionate, are more to listen, and hopefully our elders will start coming in to our meetings. It's 10 o'clock. I'm old, and I'm getting tired. <laughs> this shouldn't last so long, you know? If we met more often, it only last an hour, two hours, and everybody be able to say what they have to say. But this is in 6 o'clock, eh? Yeah. So hopefully, you think about the things that were said. I thought it was very interesting. There's some things that I didn't know about and some things that I knew that were already happening. But it's very interesting. We should have it more often. Thank you. Well, all you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, um, just going to say, did you check with Hillary how many times we've had these meetings? Okay, thank you. So with that, I, I think that's some good words to end on. Um, thank you, everybody, for your, uh, your dedication to this meeting and sticking it through. Um, long conversation. I don't know if we have a, a number yet on how many of these we've done, but it has definitely been more than two, uh, at least five. 
in this building. We had one at the school, and I think we've had a couple other consultations. So we, we've had a number of meetings, which is good. We tried to follow the three-month rule uh, and have one every three months. I think we put one one time uh, in a two-month span, but it seemed yeah. to be too tight. Uh, so yeah, we, we stuck with that three-month rule uh, throughout. So It was every three months, then we moved them to two months. It, it's harder to get here, but I understand the point. I really do. It's hard to get here every couple of months. It, it really is, but understand, heard you loud and clear. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope you have a good evening, and thank you for sharing. A lot of good input. Thank you.